Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Now, the adventures of Superman. As we rejoin Lois and Jimmy now, they have just burst into the private office of Perry White, editor of the Daily Planet. Keith, Keith, read this. It just came in on the American Press teletype. That's the idea of barging into my office without knocking. Didn't anybody ever... There wasn't time, Chief. Here, read it. Close that door. There's a draft. Close it, Jimmy, will you? Chief, will you read this, please? Read what? This wire flash. You just came in. Uh, Where are my glasses? Where'd you put them? If I knew where I put them, I'd dim wit. I'd know where to find them. Chief, you've got to read this quickly. There's no time to wait. How can I read it without my glasses? Well, don't shout at me. Who's shouting at you? You are. I am not. Why don't you read it to him, Miss Lane? Well, that's the first intelligent suggestion I've ever heard you make, Olson. Gee, thanks. Well, go ahead, go ahead, read it, Lois. What to say? Well, hold on to your chair. Never mind about my chair. Read it. Okay, okay. The Federal Bureau of Investigation today swore out a warrant for the arrest of Superman in connection with... Now, if this is your idea of a gag, Lois... It's no gag, Honest, Chief. Chief. I saw it come in on the machine. A federal warrant for Superman's arrest? That's what it looks like. A warrant for the arrest of Superman in connection with an offense against national security. Ah, they're crazy. They're out of their minds. Whether they are or not, it's still a page one story. Oh, where's Kent? I saw him go out a little while ago. No, oh, why is it he's never around when I need him? Why? What do you why? need him for? I can handle it. Okay, okay. Uh, Olsen. Uh, yes, sir? Uh, you get back to the teletype room and see if there's a follow-up on that flash. Right. And report to me as soon as you get something. You bet. Hi, Jim. Well, hi, Mr. Kent. Keep looking for you. Oh, really? Something up? Yes, Mr. Kent. Something is Come up. Come in and close the door. Oh, what's all the excitement? Here, Clark, read this. Federal Bureau investigation warrant for arrest of Superman. What? Oh, read the rest. Connection with offense against national security. Is this someone's idea of a gag? That's exactly what I said. And I repeat, it's no gag. Jimmy and I saw it come over the American press wire. An offense against national security? Mm -hmm. I don't get it. Mm, Neither do we. Now listen, you get on the phone to FBI headquarters in Washington and... and No, 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 never mind, never mind. Skip the phone, skip the phone. Uh, Get on the first plane out of Metropolis and... I won't need a plane. What do you mean, you won't need a plane? I want you to fly to Washington. No, I'll see you later. Now, wait a minute. Where do you think you're going? Find out what this is all about. So long. Striding swiftly through the editorial department, Clark Kent steps into an empty storeroom and locks the door behind him. Then, peeling off his street clothes and removing his horn-rimmed glasses, he stands revealed in the startling red cape and blue costume of Superman. Stepping to a window, he raises it quickly. And then... Up! Up! And away! Leaping high into the noonday sky, Superman takes a bearing from the sun. And then, like a giant red and blue arrow, streaks southward toward Washington, his brilliant cape streaming in the wind. A short time later, he's in a private FBI office with Charles Miller, a special agent, and an unidentified army officer wearing the wings of a colonel and the military intelligence insignia. Miller speaks. I want you to know, Superman, that we appreciate your having come in of your own accord. Serving a warrant on you might have been a little difficult. May I ask why you considered it necessary to issue a warrant at all? Whatever it is you want me for, don't you think a simple request for my appearance would have been enough? This happens to be a very serious matter. I, uh, I don't think we've been introduced, Colonel. Oh, I, uh, I'm sorry. This is Colonel Reed of Military Intelligence. Oh. How do you do, sir? How do you do? Now is for the reason for issuing a warrant. Well, never mind that now. The, uh, the damage, whatever it is, has been done. What do you want? Colonel Reed would like to ask... I'm sure the colonel can speak for himself, Mr. Miller. You're quite right. And the first thing I'd like to suggest is that you change your attitude. What? Change my attitude? Yes. As I mentioned a moment ago, the charge against you happens to be of a serious nature. What charge? You are accused of an offense against national security. An offense which in time of war would be considered high treason. High (laughs) treason? You know, this is really becoming quite humorous. There's nothing humorous about another war, Superman. What? And particularly now. As General Eisenhower said recently, if there's another war, the Earth and all the people on it will suffer the greatest disaster and catastrophe that man has ever known. Well, he's right. Everyone knows that. And no one wants war. Naturally. Well, then what's this all about? Why all this talk of war? Why don't we all use the same energy in working for peace? That's exactly what we're doing. Yes. Yes. It's in an effort to guard against war that we find it necessary to question you, Superman. Me? What have I done? Suppose you tell us. Suppose you tell us all you know about a secret aerial rocket. I beg your pardon. You heard me. What do you know about a secret rocket capable of traveling unlimited distances through space? 
a rocket a thousand times more powerful than the German B-2, and now being offered for sale to a foreign power which is not a member of the United Nations. Why, I don't know a thing about it. You deny having any knowledge of this rocket? Well, I most certainly do. Well, perhaps it might refresh your memory if I told you this rocket has a very interesting name. Oh, has it? Yes. It's called the Superman rocket. Well, what does that prove? That in itself proves nothing. But we have evidence that leads us to believe that you were responsible for designing the Superman rocket. Superman, suppose you tell Mr. Miller and me all you know about it. It might just as well, Superman. But this is incredible, and it, it's like a bad dream. Do you two men really believe I had anything to do with a, a rocket being offered for sale to a foreign government? Well, do you? Well, uh, it doesn't seem possible. Well, in view of your previous service to the country, I must say it's a little hard to take. But we have the evidence. What evidence? The name of the rocket. Oh, anyone could have used my name. Plus a letter to a foreign agent in which it is stated that this rocket is based on an original design of a rocket belonging to you. Would you repeat that, please? We have a letter, or at least Mr. Miller has, written to a foreign agent offering the rocket for sale. In the letter, it is clearly stated that the rocket being offered is based on an original design of a rocket belonging to Superman. A, a rocket belonging to Superman? Did you ever design an aerial rocket? Well, design one? No, no, of course not. No, you don't seem quite sure. Well, I... I... I'm trying to think. Well, certainly you'd know whether or not you designed a rocket. After all, things like that. Wait, wait. wait. Well, it could be. What could be? The rocket. The one you said was mentioned in the letter. Well, what about it? It could be my rocket. Then you did design one. No, but it could still be mine. It could still be the Superman rocket. Yes, Colonel Reed, you're right. I did own a rocket. A Superman rocket. Then you admit the charges against you. I admit nothing. You tell me a letter written to a foreign agent mentioned a Superman rocket. Yes, and you admitted only such a rocket. Any attempt to deny it now will only... Just a minute, please. I'm not denying it, but I'm not admitting to any charges of treason. But if you admit owning the rocket... But I haven't seen it in 35 years. What was that? I said I haven't seen the rocket I'm talking about in 35 years. I... Well, I'm afraid I, I don't know what you mean. No. No, probably not. But I'm going to clear it all up for you by telling you a strange story. The story of how I happened to come to Earth. I'm going to ask you to make use of your imagination and come with me on a far journey, millions of miles from the Earth, where once the planet Krypton shone like a green star in the endless heavens. Here, civilization was far advanced. It had brought forth a race of supermen, men and women like ourselves, but advanced to the absolute peak of human perfection. As we near Krypton, we see high walls and gleaming turrets. We approach the magnificent Temple of Wisdom with its dome of pure crystal shimmering like a diamond in the sun. Inside the temple, in a great marble hall, Jor-El, Krypton's leading man of science, is about to address a special meeting of the planet's governing council. White-bearded Rosanne, the supreme leader of the council, is calling for order. Attention, gentlemen. Attention, please. Members of the Governing Council, you have been summoned here on urgent business. As you are well aware, Krypton has been experiencing some strange phenomena. Only last week on the full moon, a great tidal wave threatened to engulf this city. There have been mysterious quakes and eruptions, some of which have done great damage. Since the safety and welfare of our people is the responsibility of the Council, I therefore, as your Supreme Leader, Request the Jorel, our brilliant young scientist, to investigate these phenomena and to determine, if possible, their cause. He is here with me on the platform, ready to deliver his report. Gentlemen, Jorel speaks. Members of the Governing Council, I have completed my solar calculations, and much as I dread uttering these faithful words, I have come to the conclusion that Krypton is doomed. <laughs> gentlemen, 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 hear him out, please. Proceed, Jorel. These internal quakes we've been experiencing, these volcanic eruptions, the giant tidal wave Roseanne mentioned, all point to only one thing. 
The planet Krypton is utterly and finally doomed. Gentlemen, please. There is no cause for alarm. I am certain Joel can explain these strange utterance. There is nothing to explain, Roseanne. Do you think I bring you this news gladly? Believe me, I wish with every fiber of my being that I were the bearer of more pleasant tidings, but unfortunately I'm not. I've worked long into the night for many nights, and there is no other conclusion that can be reached. Could it be there exists some error in your calculations, Jorel? No, Roseanne, there is no error. I have checked and rechecked a dozen times. The result is always the same. Namely, that Krypton is doomed. Yes. The sun is gradually drawing Krypton closer to it. Within a month, possibly a week, maybe even a matter of days, the gravitational pull will be so tremendous that Krypton will not be able to weather the strain. And then our great planet will explode like a giant bubble, destroying every living thing on it. Gentlemen, one moment, please. Now, Jorel, assuming for the moment that you what you say is true, how are we to avoid this horrible catastrophe facing us? How can we stop it? We cannot stop it, Roseanne. It is a force of nature that even we who are supermen are powerless to prevent. But we can escape. Escape? What do you mean? As you know, I've been working these many months on a model of a spaceship, an aerial rocket, which in its final form is designed to carry the entire population of Krypton to another planet. The model of the spaceship is almost completed, and within a day or two I intend launching it on a test flight. If the flight is successful, which I am certain it will be, and if you will assign to me a thousand skilled workmen, I will construct a full-size spaceship before the end comes. It is all well and good to speak of spaceships and aerial rockets, Jorel. But where would we go? To what planet would we transport the population of Krypton? To the planet Earth. My studies tell me this planet has an atmosphere almost identical with our own. Jorel, you have been working too hard. You need a rest. Believe me, we have the utmost respect for your knowledge and integrity. But this is too much. Planets as large as Krypton do not explode like bubbles. Wait! Wait, you hear that? I hear only a distant thunder. It's not thunder, Roseanne. It's an eternal eruption. Gas exploding in giant pockets. You're listening to the forewarning of doom. Quakes like that are sounding the death knell of Krypton. It will happen and happen soon. When the last great eruption comes... When it comes, jor we will all be ready for it. <laughs> Very well, laugh if you wish. Roseanne, as you members of the council, I have no time to laugh. My Wuklara and my infant son are dear to me. It's not my intention to stand by and see them destroyed. <laughs> Remember what I said, gentlemen, when Krypton is shattered into a thousand million pieces. When the glorious civilization we've built is no more. When you and your families are swept from the face of Krypton like dust. Order, gentlemen. Order, please. Members of the governing council, you've heard jor speak. Is it your wish that we devote time and energy to build a spaceship in order, as jor suggests, that the entire population of Krypton be transported to the planet known as Earth? No! Oh, no! Those in favor, say I. The council has spoken, jor Yes. And sign the death warrant of every living thing on Krypton. There remains only one thing for me to do. Prepare for the salvation of my wife, Lara, my infant son, and myself. As for the rest of you, may God have mercy on your souls. Convinced that Krypton's destruction was imminent, jor my father, left the Temple of Sim and hurried to the terrace of our hilltop home and laboratory and set feverishly to work on the steel model of a small spaceship or aerial rocket which he planned to use in a test flight. Time was short, as he alone knew. A matter of days, possibly only hours. Driving home the last rivet, he stepped back to examine the bullet-shaped rocket, only to discover Lara, my mother, standing behind him. Lara, I didn't hear you come out. You were too intent on your work. What did the council say, jor They laughed at me, Lara. Marked me for a fool. A fool? Yes. But no matter. The model is finished now. Tomorrow at dawn, I'll send it on its way and watch its flight through the high-powered telescope on the observatory roof. Once I've proved to myself that it will work, I'll begin building one large enough to carry all three of us to the planet Earth. jor you have often spoken of this planet you call Earth, but never have you described it to me. What is it like? Well, it's a planet similar to our own in many respects, except that it is inhabited by a race of people much inferior to us. Inferior? 
What do you mean, Julia? Earthmen are weak, Lara. For instance, we cover a distance of many miles with one step. An Earthman's step is only three feet. How queer. What else, Julia? Well, Earthmen do not always live in harmony. They sometimes wage what is known as war. War? I do not know the word. No, and better that you never knew it. It is a wicked thing. When war is waged, Earthmen destroy one another. How horrible. And is this the place you plan to take us? There is no choice, Lara. Of all the planets, only the Earth has an atmosphere similar to our own. It is the only other planet on which we can live. Oh. Lara, something wrong? I don't know. I, I feel faint. It seems to have grown oppressively hot. Is that because we're being drawn closer to the sun, Jorel? Yes. Oh. There's a strange glow in the western sky. I don't like it. Where is Khalil? Asleep. I had quite a time with him. He was restless all afternoon. Jorel, what was that? An internal quake. A bad one. Jorel, the house is shaking. Let me pass over. You'd, uh, you'd better go in. No, my place is with you. Jorel, look. The sky, it's dark. <laughs> Lara, listen to me. This is the end. Krypton is breaking apart. What can we do, Jorel? Nothing. I was a fool to wait this long. It wasn't your fault, Jorel. The council... I should have built a spaceship large enough for all of us months ago. Now we've only a small model. But wait. It can carry one of us to safety. You, Lara. No. Well, if only one of us can be saved, it should be our son. I'll get him. No, Lara. Lara, come back. Perhaps she's right. It should be the boy. Now, if I can only get this atomic generator working, build up enough pressure. There. Joel! Here he is. Bill, back to sleep. I'll open the door. Now, put him inside. Gently. Joel, are you sure this is the end? Hurry, Lara. He's injured. Good. Now, stand back, Lara. The pressure's building up. How long will it take? I don't know. Look! The Temple of Wisdom is on fire. The towers are crumbling. Come close to me, Lara. The end is not far off. The mountains are breaking apart. Jorah, pressure. What's happening? Building up slowly. We, we may be too late. If it doesn't happen soon... Ah! Lara, it's gone. Our son. Our son is on his way to Earth. Lara! Colonel Reed, the tiny rocket shot through space, heading toward Earth and leaving the glowing fragments of the exploded planet Krypton behind it. It's an amazing story, Superman. Simply amazing. Uh, did the rocket reach the Earth? <laughs> if it hadn't, I wouldn't be here. Oh, oh, of course. How stupid of me. It landed in an Iowa cornfield. When it struck the ground, it burst into flames. The infant inside the rocket was rescued by a farmer and his wife. That infant, of course, was you. That's right. I was raised by that farmer and his wife whose name, of course, I cannot tell you. They have both since passed on. But somewhere on their farm, I seem to remember having seen the charred and twisted shell of the rocket that brought me to Earth. The Superman rocket. Is that the rocket you referred to when you said you did have something to do with a rocket? Yes. Certainly, if it transported me millions of miles through space, the design of it should be of value. Oh, there's no question about that. Only I'm afraid we're too late. Why? That letter I mentioned, the letter to a foreign agent offering the rocket for sale... Yes? It stated definitely that the rocket was based on the design of one originally owned by Superman. Evidently, someone else knew about the original rocket. But I don't see how that's possible. The people who brought me up never breathed a word of my origin. However, there's one good way to find out. Hmm? What's that? I'll go back to the farm and search it. I'll go with you. No, no, you better let me handle this alone. It's almost noon. I'll be back here before dark. Well, that's impossible. You said the farm's in Iowa. Why, even by plane... You're forgetting something, Colonel. Mm, what? I'm Superman, remember? Of course. Well, there I go again. However, there is one difficulty. Mm, what's that? Well, uh, I'm still under arrest. Oh, don't worry about that. I'll have the warrant canceled. It never should have been issued in the first place. Thank you. Well, the sooner I get going, the better. I'll walk you to the elevator. I prefer the window, if you don't mind. You... You mean you're going to... Just watch. I'll either be back with the model of that rocket, Colonel, or information as to what happened to it. So long. So long, Superman. And good luck. Thanks. Up and away! Superman, now in the guise of Clark Kent, a mild-mannered and bespectacled young man, is approaching a dilapidated, weather-beaten farmhouse set back some distance from the road in the Iowa corn country. 
A few dirty, straggly chickens are pecking in the yard, and a thin, unhappy-looking cow, fly-ridden and mangy, is tethered to a rope too short to reach a patch of green clover, and as a result is mooing pitifully. As Kent enters the yard, the front door of the farmhouse opens and a man steps out. He's carrying a shotgun. Raising it, he levels it at Kent. Get off this property before I fill you full of buckshot. Now, just a minute, mister. All I want is... I know to... what you want. You ain't gonna get it, so get moving. Oh, you got me wrong. I used to live... You heard what I said. Get moving, get moving fast. Now, Three what? is the most I feel like counting today. When I get done counting the day out of that gate, I blow your head off. Please, listen to me. One. I used to live on this farm. Two. My name is Kent. Three. My name is Clark Kent. What's that you said? I'm Clark Kent. I used to live on this farm. My, my my father owned it at one time. Step a my closer. Mind you, no shenanigans. All right. Hey, that's fair enough. Now, let me get a good look at you. Ah, sure. You ain't even Kent's boy. Well, I, I left the farm 15 years ago. People change, you know. Look at you, young fella. You're aiming to trick me. It ain't gonna work. I'm smart as the next fella and twice as ornery. I bought this here farm fair and square, and I'm aiming to live on it peaceful. Well, well there's no reason why you shouldn't, Mr. Uh... Luke Terry means innocent to you? Luke Terry. Well, the name sounds familiar. Hey, that play acting ain't fooled me one bit. I got the shotgun cocked and my finger on the trigger. I'm not play acting. And I'm not trying to trick you. I can prove I'm Clark Kent if you'll give me a chance. Wait. If you don't mind, you would stay right where you're at. Don't inch up no closer. How are you going to prove it? Well, I- I'll describe the inside of the house. <laughs> there are uh, three rooms on the ground floor and three on the upper floor. That don't prove nothing. The house in the county built different. Oh, just a minute. Wait a minute. There's an iron sink in the kitchen with a crack on the right side. The handle of the water pump is welded. And two of the stove lids are chipped around the edges. The wood box is to the left of the stove. And unless you've changed it or it's faded out, there was some lettering on that box. I I believe it was Union Thread Company, Salem, Massachusetts. There, is that enough? What's in the basement? There isn't any basement. There's a root cellar under the kitchen. We used to keep a pickle barrel down there, and there were shelves for canned goods. I reckon you're Evans' boy, all right. What you want? Well, nothing very much, really. Just an old piece of twisted metal junk I left here years ago. Uh-huh. Piece of junk that isn't worth anything to anyone but me. That's what you think. What do you mean? Seems like other folks got different ideas. What are you driving at, Mr. Terry? Do you know the piece of junk I'm talking about? I reckon I do. Where is it? Sold it. You sold it? Yeah, about seven months ago. Two fellas gave me twenty-five dollars for it. Drove up one of them fancy station wagons. And... What do they look like? Oh, let's see now. Here's I can recollect. One of them was a big fella with a red beard. And the other one? I don't picture him none too clear. Seems like though he's kind of short and darkish. Yes, go on. Uh, Did they say what... anything? Well, wasn't paying much attention. Think back, Mister Terry. I see. I right, come think of it. The fella with the red beard said something had me a mite puzzled. What was it? Well, when him tell the fella was loading the junk into the station wagon, I heard him say, I, I told you that Bible was on the level. Bible? What Bible? Don't ask me. Bible? Bible? Wait a minute, I know. Even Kent kept a record of everything important that happened. He wrote it down in the back of the family Bible. Huh? You must have recorded my coming to Earth in the rocket. Mr. Terry... What happened to Eben Kent's Bible? How tender Asian would I know? Well, you bought the farm. It, it was somewhere in the house. All I did in was the land. And the buildings and the farming equipment. All the personal and household stuff went at auction. Well, who bought it? Don't ask me. Ask the auctioneer. Oh, who was the auctioneer? Sam Wilkins over at Centerville. Thank you, Mr. Terry. to trace my foster father's old Bible, Mr. Wilkins, and Luke Terry says you might know who bought it at the auction. Well, now, let's see. Sure would have a list right here in this drawer. Came across it just the other day, cleaning out some stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah here it is. Can't fire them off. Oh, good. Now, let's see. Uh, lot number 24, sorted books. That's it. Who bought them? Lot number 24, sorted books, $9, Mary Tompkins. You remember Miss Tompkins? Folks call her Aunt Mary. Oh, yes, of course, but... I don't think she bought the Bible. According to this list, she got all the books. Suppose I ring her up and ask her. She'd remember, likely. Now, let's see. Number, please. Uh, 612, operator. Thank you. Now, been a long time since I've seen you, Clark. you changed some. Grow a little. <laughs> well, it's been all of 15 years. Oh, at least that. Hello? Oh, Miss Tompkins? Yeah? This is Sam Wilkins calling. Oh, yeah. Well, how are you, Sam? Just fine, Miss Tompkins. Just fine. How are you? Oh, I'm fairly middling, Sam. 
keeping body and soul together somehow. I'm glad to hear it. Uh, tell me, Miss Tompkins, you recall back a ways buying up a lot of books at the Kent auction? Uh, oh, yeah. Yes, Sam, I believe I do. Uh, some years ago, though. Yes, Quas. Uh, Miss Tompkins, you recall uh, Eben Kent's family Bible in that lot? Yes, I do, Sam. You do, eh? Hey? She recalls it, Clark. Oh, good. Yes. Well, uh, I, I'll tell you, Miss Tompkins, Clark Kent is down here now. Clark Kent? Land sakes alive. How is he? He's fine, just fine. <laughs> I uh, tell you, Miss Tompkins, I'll drive Clark over to your place to get it. Fine, Sam. I'll be glad to see you. Ralph? Ralph, was it you who got into my trunk? Who, oh, me? What are you talking about? You know right well what I'm talking about. The lock of that trunk was picked open. Ah, uh, you're always blaming me for something. Well, I've got good reason to. Gambling and stealing and drinking. If you wasn't my own poor dead brother's son, I'd have turned you out long since. All right, all right. Suppose I did look in the trunk. Nothing there but some old books. So happens they was books that I aimed to keep. One of them was a Bible bound up with silver. Old Eben Kemp's Bible. What did you do with it? I didn't do anything with it. Oh, that's a lie, Ralph Tompkins. I can tell by your face. What would I do with an old Bible? You'd sell it if you could. Now, you better tell me what you've done with it. Clark Kent's on his way over here now Clark to get Kent's it. Clark Kent's coming here. Yeah, he's on his way with Sam Wilkins. You'd better tell me what you've done with that Bible, else you'll be in a heap of trouble. You'll likely go to jail, you will. Yeah. Where are you going? Uh, just remember, I got something to do. Ralph Tompkins, you come back here. Get out of that car, Ralph. You hear me? Ralph, I've got to know about that Bible. Where are you going? Don't know, but I might be gone for quite a spell. Ralph! secret weapon known as the Superman rocket and said to be capable of interplanetary flight at supersonic speed was being offered for sale to a foreign government, Superman recalled that he himself, as an infant, had come to Earth from the planet Krypton in just such a rocket. Streaking to the Iowa farm where he had been reared as Clark Kent and where the twisted wreckage of the rocket had lain rusting and forgotten for years, he discovered to his dismay that it had been sold to two unknown men for $25. One of the men, a man with a red beard, had mentioned a Bible, and Kent remembered that his late foster father had recorded important family events in the back of his Bible. Obviously, the Bible which contained the story of his arrival on Earth had fallen into unscrupulous hands. Step by step, Kent traced the Bible to an old family friend, Aunt Mary Tompkins. But when he arrived at Aunt Mary's home, he was told the Bible had been stolen by her nephew. Oh, I feel just terrible about this, Clark. But there ain't nothing I can do or say. I know I've been harboring a thief in my house all these years, but Ralph Tompkins was my own kith and kin, my poor brother Fred's boy, and I, well, I didn't have the heart to turn him out. Oh, don't cry, Aunt Mary. I I understand. (laughs) Nothing but shame, shame, shame ever since he got out of knee bridges. Uh, Tell me, Aunt Mary, you you said Ralph drove off in a car. Yes, about 15 minutes ago when I told him you was coming for the Bible. Well, Well, what kind of a car was it? Well, it was one of them open cars. He'd had it painted bright yellow. He didn't come by it honest, I can tell you. Yellow convertible. Which way did he go? Well, he swung left on the highway. Uh Oh, he's sly and tricky, and the truth ain't in him. Well, if I find him, I'll know how to handle him. I'd I'd better get along, I guess. Thanks for everything, Aunt Mary. Clark, you ain't going to hold this against me. Of course not. You did all you could. Well, good night, Aunt Mary. Good night, Clark, and, and God bless you. He's got 20 minutes start on me, but if he sticks to the highway, I shouldn't have any trouble finding a bright yellow convertible. There, it's dark enough out here so I won't be seen. Out of these clothes. This is a job for Superman. There we are. All set. Now, up, up, and away! Red tape streaming, Superman leaps up into the darkness like a comet. High in the heavens, he hovers in curious flight. His keen eyes searching a winding network of roads and highways far below. Now to get a bird's eye view from up here. Now, there are quite a few cars on the main highway, but no sign of a yellow convertible. Let's see. 20 minutes, maybe 25. Driving fast, he could be 20 or 30 miles away. Now there's only one thing to do. Search every road within 100 miles until I pick up his car. Away! Meanwhile, on an east-west highway some 40 miles from Centerville, state troopers Bill Sweets and Dan Taylor have just left their barracks and are stepping into their patrol car as a yellow convertible top down roars past them at high speed. Its only occupant, a bareheaded driver. Swiftly, Trooper Taylor at the wheel of the patrol car kicks into gear and sets out in pursuit. 
I sure it's an awful hurry, Danny. Too much of a hurry. Wait till I get rolling, Bill, and give him the siren. Right. These speed boats, they're hopped up jalopies, cutting papers on public highways. They ought to have their heads examined. Most of their heads would show up blank on an x-ray plate. Okay, let's have that siren. Yeah, the little punk, he's stepping it up faster. He'll slow down when he hits that corkscrew turn on the cliff road. He'll be there in a minute unless he slows up. I know. He'll never be able to stay on the road. It's 500 feet down to the gully at the bottom of the cliff. Give him the siren again. Okay, but I don't think it'll do any good. What did I tell you? He's still doing 70. He'll slow down when he sees the signs for the corkscrew. He'd better keep the siren going, Bill. As siren wide open, the state troopers race after the speeding yellow convertible as it nears the dreaded corkscrew turn at the peak of the cliff. <laughs> Meanwhile, having searched vainly over the main roads for Ralph Tompkins' car, Superman has swooped eastward to the junction of two highways, and high in the night sky pauses for another bird's eye view of the terrain below. Still no sign of a yellow convertible. I've got to find it, though. Let's see, intersecting highways down there. Well, I'll check the north-south one first, then come back. Wait. What's that? Sounds like a police siren to the east. Yes, I can see two cars on a winding cliff road too far away to make them out. But that siren, maybe I'd better investigate. Away! He's going into the turn, Dan. He'll never make it. Look bad. Pull off, you crazy fool. Dan, he's off the road. He's smashing through the guardrail. Hurry! Hurry! Ralph Tompkins' yellow convertible plunged off the road and dropped toward the gully 500 feet below. Superman, drawn by the patrol car siren, has been streaking through the sky toward the scene. As we continue now, the man of steel is a mile high in the air as he sees the yellow convertible spinning end over and through space. And a man's body thrown clear of the car, falling after it. Great Scott! Down! Down! Down like a giant bird of prey, Superman snatches the falling body in midair, a scant yard above the jagged rocks at the bottom of the gully. Then, cradling the body in his arms, he is about to streak up again when he realizes that Ralph Tompkins has been seriously injured. The boy's face is bloodless and chalk white, and his mouth is twisted in pain. Dropping to the floor of the gully, Superman lays him gently on the ground. Bending over him, it becomes obvious that the end is not far off. Ralph Tompkins' neck has been broken. But he is still conscious, his eyes staring up into the sky, his lips moving soundlessly. Superman leans closer. Ralph. Ralph, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I can hear you. You've been seriously hurt, Ralph. I don't dare move you. I know. I'm dying. It's all over. Maybe not. I'm going to try to get a doctor and bring him here. No, no, please. It won't help. Anyway, it doesn't matter. I had it coming. All my life, nothing but bad, bad, bad. Ralph. Bad. Ralph, tell me about the Bible. Uh, Even Kent's Bible. What did you do with it? No good. Just no good. All my life. Ralph, you <laughs> must tell me about the Bible. Did you sell it? Always trouble. Always doing wrong. Ralph, listen to me. Never good for anything. Ralph. I know. I know I deserve it. I'm not complaining at coming the to The Bible, me. Ralph, it's important. What did you do with it? To whom did you sell it? Ralph. Ralph. Buy Aunt Mary for me. Just say goodbye and tell her I'm sorry for everything. Yes, I'll tell her. But what about the Bible, Ralph? To whom did you sell it? Tired. So tired. Ralph, you've got to tell me. The lives of millions of people may depend on it. Uh, now, this is your chance to do something good, uh, something really good. I never did anyone any good. Never. Now, this is your chance. Can you hear me, Ralph? Yes. Yes, I hear you. All right, listen carefully. Yeah. That Bible is the only method we have of tracing uh, some people who own an aerial rocket. Uh, a rocket capable of being used as a dangerous weapon. Uh, powerful enough to destroy whole cities. You understand? Yeah. Well, we've got to get to those people, Ralph. We've got to get to them before they can sell their rocket to a foreign power, or else this country and every living thing in it may be wiped out. Why? Why are you telling me this? The Bible. Eben Kent's yeah. Bible. Remember you took it from your Aunt Mary's trunk? Yes. You sold it, didn't you? Yes. Yeah. Where did you sell it? And to whom? Uh, Ralph, where did you sell the Bible? Metropolis. To whom? To whom, Ralph? Bookstore. Second hand. Do you remember the address? 
Yes. What is it? Eight and... and... Yes, eight and when? Well, not... Goodbye. Going now. Goodbye. Goodbye, Ralph. Lifting the now limp and lifeless body of the boy in his arms, Superman carries up to the road where two state troopers are waiting. Then, like a red and blue arrow, he rockets upward and disappears into the night sky. An hour later, once again in his guise of Clark Kent, mild-mannered newspaper reporter, he enters a second-hand bookstore on the corner of 8th and Walnut in the city of Metropolis. The neatly lettered sign on the door reads, William Davis, Rare Books, Fine Editions, Bought and Sold. As he enters the store, crowded ceiling high with books, a gray-haired man steps forward to meet him. Good evening, sir. Can I help you? I hope so. My name is Clark Kent. I'm a reporter for the Daily Planet. Are you Mr. Davis? Uh, y- yes. Oh, good. Well, I, uh, I'm not here in my reportorial capacity tonight, Mr. Davis. Oh. I, I have a little personal matter I think you can help me with. I'm looking for a Bible. Well, that should be no problem. We have quite a few fine Bibles in stock. Well, I'm looking for a particular Bible, one you purchased the young man some months ago. Well, I buy a great many books, Mr. Kent. Bibles among them, uh, it might be difficult to identify any given one. Perhaps if I describe it, you may recall the incident. Well, perhaps. Well, it, it was bound in, in heavy black leather, mm-hmm. calf, I believe, with some some silver filigree work on both covers. Oh. As I recall, it was printed in England and was quite old. Oh, I remember the Bible well, Mr. Kent. You do? It, uh, an early stone lay printing, a uh-huh. Geneva edition dated 1632. That's right. Do you have it here, Mr. David? Uh, why, uh, no, sir, no. I sold it almost immediately. Oh. It was a fine edition. Yes, well, may I ask to whom you sold it? Uh, to a collector, sir. Do you remember his name? I'm sorry, but I never reveal the names of my collector clients. What? I think you'll find that the practice of all reputable book dealers. You see, many people don't wish it generally known that they have large and valuable book collections in their homes. Well, it, it would help me very much if you'd make an exception in this case, Mr. Uh, Davis. I'm sorry, Mr. Davis, but that's impossible. Now, if you wish, I'll try to secure another stone in Geneva for you. I presume you're a collector? Well, the Bible we're talking about, the one you bought, Mr. Davis, was stolen. Stolen? That's right. The young man you bought it from stole it from his aunt, who was keeping it for me. You see, it originally belonged to my foster father. Oh, my. His name, even Kent, was on the flyleaf. Oh, good gracious. Uh, Receiving stolen goods, as you know, is a serious crime. Well, now, Mr. Kent, And if please, I should I... prefer charges, you'd be arrested. Now, of course, I'd rather not, no, but... Well, now, 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 look here, Mr. Kent. How do I know that you really own the Bible? You, uh, you might be trying to blackmail me. Here are my credentials. Uh, Press hmm. card. Union card. Police card. If that doesn't satisfy you, call Inspector Henderson at police headquarters and ask him about me. Uh, I, uh... Yes, I, I, I believe you, Mr. Kent. Good. Then how about the name of the man who bought the Bible? Uh, no, no, I, I can't tell you that. Uh, though I'll admit, I sold the Bible for $750. Quite a high price. You give me a signed receipt, Mr. Kent, and I'll write you a check for the entire amount. No deal, Mr. Davis. I want the name of the man to whom you sold the Bible. But I assure you, you can't get more than $750. I'm not interested in what I can get for it. Oh, you want the book back, is that? No, I... Well, I can understand that. It's a sentimental keepsake. All right, I'll do what I can to get it back for you, but I assure you it won't be easy. I don't want the book back. You don't? I want the name of the man to whom you sold it. I want his name and his address. But but why? I, I don't understand. Well, I... Look, Mr. Davis, I, I can't explain beyond saying that my reasons are of utmost importance to national defense. Gracious me. Now, will you please give me that information, Mr. Davis? Well, you, you leave me no choice, Mr. Kent. What's the man's name? Uh, Haller. Richard Haller. Richard Haller, H-A-L-L-E-R? Yes. But I warn you, Mr. Kent, you will find him a very unpleasant customer. His temper is as bad as, uh, as you'd expect from a man with red hair. What? Well, did you say red hair? Why, why, yes. Does he wear a beard? How did you know? Then he does. A red beard? Very red. He's the man I want. Hey. What's his address? Uh, 16 East Lilac Road. 16 East Lilac. Thanks, Mr. Davis. This is the break I've been hoping for. Good evening, Clark. What? Lois Lane. In person. Well, what? what are you doing here? Lois, don't joke about this. If you know Haller, for heaven's sake, tell me. Now, just a minute, Clark. At 10 o'clock this morning, after we got the news flash that a federal warrant had been issued for Superman's arrest, you bolted out of the office without telling anyone where you were going or why. And now, 12 hours later, you show up here and start questioning me as though I were a criminal. After all, Clark... You were the last person I expected to see coming out of Richard Haller's house. The last person. Really? Yes. When that door opened and I saw you, I... I I couldn't believe my eyes. Why not? Because Haller is the most dangerous man in the world. (laughs) Oh, Clark, 
Mark, you kill me. Please, Lois, keep your voice down. <laughs> Lois. Talk about making mountains out of molehills. You make volcanoes out of out of puffs of smoke. Oh, I do. Well, you do. All right, listen. I've been trailing the man who lives in that house ever since I left the office this morning. Oh. He's negotiating with a foreign government trying to sell an aerial rocket a hundred times more deadly than the German V-2 rocket. Now, is this one of your usual pipe things, Claude? No, it's not. I happen to know what business Richard Halder is in. Yes, so do I. He poses as a collector of rare books. That's how I traced him, to an old family Bible. You see, Lois, this rocket Haller has is based on the design of the rocket that brought Superman to Earth. What? Yes. That's why the warrant was issued for Superman's arrest. They thought he was somehow connected with it. Now, Clark, if what you're telling me is on the level... Believe me, it is. That's why I was so shocked when I saw you walk out of that door. Now, tell me, how do you happen to know Haller? I don't know him. I just came out here on a routine assignment. McElroy, the editor of the Sunday magazine section, asked me to interview Haller for a feature story on rare book collecting. Is that the truth? Why, of course. Why should I tell you anything but the truth? Come to think of it, you've got a lot of nerve doubting my word. I'm sorry, Lois. It's just that I'm all on edge. I've covered a lot of ground since 10 o'clock this morning. Come on, I'll I'll walk you to the corner and put you in a cab and then come back and I'll have a talk with Haller. A, you're not walking me to the corner. B, you're not putting me in. I'm not having a talk with Haller. Now, why not? Because he isn't home. He's out of town. He won't be back for two or three months. Who told you that? His Hindu servant. Well, I'd like to make sure. All right. Go ahead. Make sure. Ring the bell and ask him. I'll put you in a cab first. Don't you understand, Clark? I am not leaving. I'm digging close to you. Now, look. I detect a front page story. A front page story? Mm -hmm. Is that all you can think about? Sure. This might end up as a world catastrophe, and you talk about front page stories. Lois, for once, let me handle this my way, will you? And why is your way any better than my way? Because I know what it's all about. Because I'm closer to it, that's why. Good Lord, Army engineers are working night and day to develop an aerial rocket capable of extended flight at supersonic speed for our defense if we're ever attacked again. You don't have to lose your temper, Clark. Yes, I do have to lose my temper. This isn't a newspaper story, Lois. It's a matter of life or death for millions of people. If this man howls... All right, all right, calm down. Oh, sometimes I don't understand you, Lois. Well, there are times when I don't understand you either, so we're even. Now, about Haller. Since it is so important, I'm certainly not going to let you tackle it alone. But, Lois... Now, don't argue, Clark. If you don't believe Haller isn't home, just ring the bell again and make sure. Come on. Lois, wait. You're not getting rid of me, so don't even try. Come on. Oh, if it isn't one thing, it's another. What was that? Nothing. Go ahead, ring the bell. Uh, Where on earth are you staring at? Just looking the house over, inside and out. Inside? What have you got, x-ray vision? Mm-hmm. You'd be amazed if I said yes, wouldn't you? <laughs> Clark Kent, otherwise known as Superman. Funny, isn't it? Very funny. Are you going to ring the bell, Clark, or not? Yes, but I don't think Haller is home. I told you that five minutes ago, remember? Hold it, hold it, Harry. Trouble comes. with you. Who? Oh. The Hindu servant. How do you know? I, I, I can hear his footsteps. Shh. Good evening. Yes? We'd like to see Mr. Haller, please. Mr. Haller is not at home, sir. He's out of the city. He is not expected to return for two or three months. Oh, well, can you tell us where we can get in touch with him? It's, it's very important. I'm sorry. I do not know where Mr. Haller has gone. That is all, sir. No, wait. Just a moment. Yes? I, uh... You see, I have an extremely rare book I'm interested in selling, but I... Well, I need the money, and I can't possibly wait two or three months. I thought perhaps if there was any way of getting in touch with Mr. Haller, that... that... May I inquire your name, please? Uh, Kent. Clark Kent. This young lady is Miss Lane. The mem presented herself earlier. <laughs> yes. Uh, is there any way of contacting Mr. Haller? I'm sure he wouldn't want to miss this opportunity. The, the book I have to sell is the only one of its kind in the world. Will you step inside, please? Well, yes, certainly. After you, Lois. Thank you. Proceed to the trophy room on your right, please. I will be with you shortly. Thank you. You think he knows where Haller is, Clark? No doubt about it. Yeah, I guess this is the trophy room. You guess. Golly, look at those heads on the wall. A tiger. A lion. And what's that horrible thing over there? It's a rhinoceros. Haller seems to be a big game hunter as well as a book collector. Ah, the rocket belt. Hold it. I beg your pardon. Um, yes? Could you tell me what rare book you wish to offer, Mr. Haller? Well, I, I'd rather discuss the matter with Mr. Haller directly. I must first know the name of the book, sir. Well, it's a... Uh... It's a Shakespeare folio, a first folio of one of Shakespeare's plays. It's very rare. And how much are you asking for it? Well, I'm I'm willing to let Mr. Haller set the price. Do you think you can contact him? I will try. Excuse me. Certainly. I will return shortly. That's all right. Don't hurry. It's quite all right. Clark. He locked the door. Yes, I know. Well, don't just stand there. Do something. Quiet, will you? He's telephoning. 
Who is? The Hindu. Are you crazy? Please, Lois, I'm trying to hear what he's saying. Why of all the ridiculous things? In the first place, I don't Will see you how you can... please be quiet? No, I won't. And furthermore, well, unless you, you tell me... keep quiet willingly, I'll make you keep quiet. <laughs> all right, I've heard enough. Why, you... You insolent boar. What right do you have to clap your hand over my mouth? To keep it shut. I had to get some information, and I got it. What information? I know where Richard Haller is. What did you just say, Clark? I know where Haller is. I heard the Hindu put through a long-distance call to... What was that? What was what? I heard a peculiar hissing sound. There it is again. Hear it? Yes. Where's it coming from? Stopped. Stay where you are, Lois. I'll have a look around. Wait a minute, Clark. I... feel strange. What? I... I can't... can't breathe. I... Lois! Lois, what happened? Great Scotch. She's unconscious. Something is wrong, Saab. Out of my way. But, Saab, you cannot leave now. Out of my way, I said. And open the front door. If the mem Saab is ill, I will call a doctor. There isn't time. Are you going to open that front door? Oh, never mind. I'll do it myself. But, Saab. I'll see you again. Saab, come back. I have a message. I'll come back when I'm good and ready. Now to strip down to my Superman outfit before that bird comes poking out here after me. Yeah, this should be as good a place as any behind this bush. I'll just put Lois down for a moment. Better work fast. She looks bad. There we are. Does it? Poor kid's fighting for breath. I think maybe the best thing is to take her up a thousand feet where the air is cooler as Superman. Up with her. There we are. Now, up and away! <laughs> Have a look at her. Ah, she's breathing more easily up here. Yes, I better take her up a little higher. Up! Yes, this cold air seems to be doing the trick. She's not fighting for breath now. The color's better, too. And her pulse is stronger. Uh-oh, she's starting to come, too. Better get back down to earth with her and enter Clark Kent's clothes before I have a lot of embarrassing questions to answer. Get down to that little park. Down! Here, while I turn into reporter Kent again. Oh, there was shoes. There. Mm. Tie. Uh, and my specs. Mm. And the hat. There. Uh, mm, just in time. Mm. I'm right here, Lois. You feel better? Yes, I. What, what am I doing here? Where am I? You're in a little park near Haller's house. In, in a park? Yes, you fainted, and I brought you out here. Remember? I, I remember feeling dizzy, but. But that's all. You say I fainted? Oh, you went out like a light. Good here, heavens. wait a minute. Let me help you up. Take it easy now. Oh. There. Thanks, Clark. You sure you're all right now? Yes. I'm just a little weak in the knees. I bet. I can't understand it. I was feeling fine, and then suddenly well, I... think I... I know what happened. You do? Mm-hmm. What? You remember that hissing sound just before you said you felt dizzy? Hissing sound? Yeah. Oh, yes. What about it? Well, it seemed to come from that mounted tiger's head on Haller's wall. From the tiger's head? Yes, and I thought I saw a fine spray of vapor shoot out of the tiger's mouth. Oh, I thi- Clark, don't be absurd. I'm not. I think a spray of knockout gas came from that tiger's mouth. Knockout gas? Uh-huh. Why, of And all... I think our Hindu friend was responsible, Mr. Richard Haller's servant. He could have released it from the room where he was telephoning. I didn't have time to check, but I'll bet there's a tube running from a gas container to that mounted tiger's head. Wait a minute. If it was gas, why weren't you knocked out, too? Huh? Oh, well, I... Yes, I'm just stronger than you are, Lois. You've also been pipe dreaming again. What? Now, why should that nice little Hindu try to knock us out? I think he suspected we weren't there to sell a rare book. In fact, I made a bad mistake giving him my right name. Why? Haller knows the name Kent. When the Hindu called him and told him my name, he got orders to give us the gas treatment. I'll bet on it. Well, you may be right. I know I'm right. Now, look, Lois, I'm to take you home and then be on my way. On your way where? To see Haller. Well, isn't that a coincidence? So am I. Now, look, Lois, you're still shaky. Not anymore. And there's a good chance I'll run into trouble. You've already had a sample of Haller's tactics. Uh Uh-huh. Now that you've got that off your chest, let's go. But, Lois, you're in... I four o'clock. I'm sticking with you on this. Now, look... Incidentally, where... Were you on the level when you said you knew where Haller was? I know approximately where he is. I heard his servant give the number to the telephone operator. But how could you? He was in another room and the door was closed. I couldn't hear a thing. I've got pretty sharp ears. Must have ears like a cat, for which I'm grateful. Where is our book-collecting friend? He's about 250 miles upstate. Now, I can get there much faster alone, Lois, so I'll take you home. Uh, Huh? How? Oh, well, uh... uh, I thought so. How do we go? By train or car? But I... 
Oh, okay. You win. <laughs> we'll take my car. We can be up there by morning. Good. Let's go. <laughs> Driving through the night, Kent and Lois Lane reach the little upstate village of Evansville shortly after daybreak. As we join them now, they are in a diner having breakfast, alone except for the proprietor. As he eats, Kent thumbs through the small local telephone directory. Mm-hmm. Any luck, Clark? No, not yet, Lois. Uh, 176 is the number, but I don't see it listed here. Well, I hate to be a killjoy, but chances are you didn't even hear the Hindu clearly. No, oh, I heard him clearly enough. There are a lot of numbers in this little book, though, and we... Uh Uh-oh, wait. Here it is. 176? That's right. And the name opposite it is Green Acres. Green Acres? Uh Uh-huh. Oh, uh, uh, pardon me, Mac. Uh, Yep. More coffee? Uh, No, not just now, thanks. Tell me, do you know of a place called Green Acres around here? Uh, Green Acres? That's right. Do you know where it is? Uh, Yeah. Can you tell us how to get there? Yeah, it's about six miles out on the old dirt road. But I wouldn't go near there if I was you. Why not? Ain't healthy, that's why. Really? I don't understand. Not many understand, young fella. Strange things happen out of Green Acres. Oh? Mighty strange things. Like what? Ain't saying. Just take my advice. Stay away. But we've got to go there. Well, don't say I didn't warn you. Now what, Clark? I don't know. That sign pointed this way, but we seem to have reached a dead end. A very creepy dead end, if you ask me. Creepy? Well, yes. You notice how how quiet these woods are? We you hardly even hear a bird. I don't like this place. Oh, you let that fellow in the diner give you the jitters. No, no, it's the place. There's a, a strange feeling about it. L- let's go back to the road and get better directions. Well, just a minute, Lois. I'll... Oh, here we are. Here we are where? Well, there's a trail behind those fallen trees. Right over here. You see? Well, yes, but... It runs downhill through the woods and... Lois! <gasps> Don't shout like that! For heaven's sake, what is it? The trail's getting warm. Follow me! Well, I... I can't see a thing. What's... What's all the excitement? In a few minutes, you'll see plenty. Come on! Tracing Haller far upstate... Superman and his guys of Clark Kent and Lois Lane, girl reporter, were following a winding foot trail through deep woods when suddenly Kent spied two large, tawny, strangely spotted creatures crouching half-hidden on the lower limbs of the trees and joining the trail, their haunches coiled and prepared to spring. At that instant, a horrible question flashed through Clark Kent's mind. How can I save Lois without revealing that I'm Superman? But even as the question flashes through his mind, the answer races with it, and he leaps into action swifter than the human eye can follow, swifter than the spotted killer's. There's a blur through the air as he lands beside Lois. One hand sweeps her flat on the ground, stunning her. And with the same motion, he turns to face the snarling creature circling down on him. Catching them in midair and locking his steel fingers in the thick fur of their throats, Kent holds them aloft, oblivious of their sharp, slashing fangs and great ripping paws. Then swiftly, as the furious beasts snarl and roar their rage, the man of steel crushes the breath out of them. Feels the vicious, tawny bodies go limp and lifeless in his hands. Then, with a mighty heave, he hurls them high over the towering trees and far into the woods. Once again, the woods are silent, save for the lone chirping of a bird off in the distance. Then Kent steps to Lois's side as the girl reporter rises unsteadily to her feet. Dazed, she stares back fearfully at the empty trail, her eyes bright with nameless terror. Clark! What happened? Well, you, you took a bad spill climbing over that log. No, the, the, there was something else. I saw two animals leap out of the trees. They, they were spotted. Yellow and, and black. Just take and, it easy, Lois. You'll be all right. I tell you, I did see them. They looked like... Like... I know. They were cheetahs. Lois. They use them for hunting in India. They do. They look like something... They look something like leopards. We're a long way from India. They had collars around their necks, and, and you were fighting with them. God, what am I talking about? It all sounds so crazy. Sure. The chances are you blacked out for a moment when you fell. Yes, of course. I'm sorry. I guess I'll be seeing pink elephants next. Oh. Look, Lois... Why don't you go back to the car, huh? This is really no place for you. Now, stop it, Clark. I'm all right now. Let's go. How much farther, Clark? These shoes weren't made for hiking in the woods. Okay, hold up. I can see it from here. See what? Look down that little hill to your left. Here, wait. I'll spread the bushes apart. There. See it? Well, I see a little farm hemmed in by the woods and... Several men. Clark, that 
big man. He has a red beard. Richard Haller. Now, our problem is... Great Scott! Clark, you frightened me. The rocket. The original Superman rocket. It's in the barn to the right of the farmhouse in a concrete pit under the floor. What are you talking about? Clark, stop staring. Yes, it's the original rocket, and it's been reconstructed. We got here just in time. In time for what? Look at Haller. See what he's carrying? No, I, I, I can't tell from here. What is it? A small model of the Superman rocket. He's going to launch it. There it goes. <gasps> Good heavens. Look at that shoot up. Colonel Reed and the FBI were right. Haller knows the secret. That model's traveling at amazing speed. Where is it? I can't see it anymore. It's above the clouds, leveling off. Lois. Yes? Get back to the car as fast as you can. Drive back into town and call Colonel Reed in Washington. No, no, no. Better yet, call Miller at the FBI. Tell him what we've seen. Clark, look. Look, the rocket is coming down. Wait, Scott, it's on fire. They don't know the secret. They've done something wrong. It's going to land right near us. What do we do? Get down. It may explode. Here it comes. Oh, Clark, I'm afraid. Don't move. Good heavens. Well, that's the end of that model. Come on, let's get a look at the fragment. No, no, wait a minute. Haller and his gang are coming up the hill. Duck behind these bushes. Don't move a muscle. Stupid, ignorant fools. A fine mess you made of things. I risk everything to bring the agent out here to witness a demonstration of the rocket. And what happens? It catches fire two minutes after we launch. You're right, Clark. He is negotiating with a fire agent. Look at it. Oh, what's left of it? Well, haven't you anything to say? Yeah, I, I do not understand. That's a it. fine answer. A fine answer. From the man who supposedly designed the German B-2 rocket. I did that. And, and what about you, Bart? An expert on aerodynamics. I gave you the original Superman rocket. I gave you unlimited funds. And this is what you turn up. Something went wrong, Mr. Howard. I don't need you to tell me that. Now, the point is, what do you propose to do? We must examine again the uh, original Superman rocket. You've been examining it for months. Uh, only with the naked eye. At this time, you will be more thorough. I have in Metropolis a special X-ray machine I invented in Germany. I will go at once and return with it by morning. We will take X-ray pictures of the original rocket. Uh, perhaps there is something in the structure of the steel, uh, something in the design of the fuel chamber that uh, we have not seen. Uh, what do you think, Barton? Sounds like a good idea. You should have thought of it a long time ago. All right. I'll try to keep the agent here until tomorrow. But don't fail this time. If you do, well... Just don't. Come on. Clark, this is incredible. That man Haller is a demon. Worse than that. He's the most dangerous man in the world. But we'll clip his wings. How? They won't take any x-ray pictures of that original Superman rocket. Why not? The moment it gets dark. We're going down there to get that rocket. Before morning, it'll be in the hands of the War Department. There it is, Lois. The original rocket that brought Superman to Earth. Are you sure, Clark? That rocket traveled millions of miles through space carrying an infant child. It could have done the same thing with high explosives or atomic bombs. Do you know what that could mean? Yes. And it's frightened me to think that a man like Haller has got possession of it. I know. There's, there's only one thing. What? Well, why, if he had the Superman rocket all this time and could copy the design, did that little model we saw in the test catch fire and crash? Well, his so-called rocket expert made one mistake. What was that? A mistake, incidentally, they'll discover the minute they take X-ray pictures of this rocket. They know now where they went wrong. Yes. You see, the nose of the rocket looks like... Who turned the lights on? I did, young man. Oh, Howard. Howard. Joe, cover them from here. Nick, you take the other side. The rest of you surround the opening in the floor. If they move a muscle, let them have it. Right. Okay. Ah, so we caught ourselves a couple of spies. Oh, just a minute. I I can explain everything. You know what happens to spies when they're caught, don't you? Caught. Easy, In case you don't, you're going to find out right now. What do you say, boss? Do I let them have it? Wait a minute. I want to ask them something first. You've already asked us. Yes, we know what happens to spies, but we're not spies. We're newspaper reporters. We, we lost our way in the woods. So you broke into this barn and climbed down into that pit looking for a road map. Is that it? No, that's not it. I didn't think so. Your name is Clark Kent and the girl's name is Lois Nane. You visited my house in Metropolis last night, posing as rare book dealers. Somehow you learned where to find me. You came up here looking for a big story. Or is that all? You seem to know all the answers. I make it my business to learn the answers, Mr. Kent. I find it very profitable. Now, one more question. Just before I turned the lights on, I overheard you tell Miss Lane that we had made one mistake in designing the model of the Superman rocket. What was that mistake? I'm a newspaper reporter, not a rocket designer. But what I know about rockets... As the son of even Kent, you might know a great deal. Clark, what is he talking about? Mr. Kent knows what I'm talking about, girlie. Well, what was the mistake? Don't waste your breath, Haller. Even if I did know, the last person in the world I'd tell would be a traitor to his country. A man who's willing to sell out humanity for a price... You. So that's the way you feel about it. That's exactly the way. All right, boys, let him have it. Come on, boys. 
Moving with the speed of light, ten feet low atop her feet and behind the protective swell of the Superman rocket, a deadly steel jacketed bullet smash into the sides of the concrete pit. Shielding the terrified girl reporter with his body, Kent hears the bull like voice of Haller echo through the barn and fury with rage. Get them! Hey, sir! Like fiery hailstones, bullets pour from the flaming muzzles of a dozen automatics, some flattening against the concrete walls of the pit, and others ricocheting wildly off the steel hull of the rocket. Hidden under the rocket and protected by Kent's invulnerable body, Lois, for the moment, is safe. But as Kent well knows, it may only be for a moment. What's the matter with you? Why don't you get them? Wait, fast! They're under the rocket! Stop firing! Hold it! Follow me. We can't get to them here. We'll go down into the pit. Clark, they're coming down for us. Don't worry. Everything's going to be all right. Oh, no, we haven't got a chance. Here they come. Let them come. They're going to be in for a surprise. And so are you. The surprise of your life. Forced to make a choice between saving Lois from instant death at the hands of Haller's gunman or revealing the long-guarded secret that Clark Kent and Superman are one and the same person, Kent takes the only possible course. Quickly, he strips off his jacket. Clark, what are you doing? Getting ready for Haller and his killers. Here, hold his glasses. Well, you're out of your mind. They've got guns. Won't matter once I get this shirt off. All right, boys. Fitting blue flame, the automatics in the hands of Howard's men send a hail of deadly whining bullets to the now unprotected spot where Lois Lane, terror stricken, couches behind Clark Kent, expecting each moment to be her last. Kent moves quickly from side to side, protecting her against the death dealing steel jacketed slugs. Then suddenly the strange and mysterious hand of fate enters the picture. A bullet from one of the automatics strikes the concrete wall of the pit and, glancing off, smashes into a metal barrel of high octane gasoline. There's a deep, muffled explosion, and almost instantly, the pit is a flaming inferno. <laughs> Gasoline exploded. There's fire all around us. We can't get out. Here, wrap my jacket around your head. Hurry. Oh, heaven. Burn your eyes. Don't say things like that. I can't breathe. It's so going to We'll be out of here in a minute. All right, keep that jacket on your head. Cut. Lois. Oh. oh, the poor kid, she passed out. Well, maybe it's better that way. Now I can handle matters. As Superman. Up with her. There. Now, out and away. <laughs> Cradling the now unconscious girl reporter in his powerful arms, Superman streaks through the roaring fire and blinding black smoke and flashes out through the open barn doors above the heads of Richard Haller's panic-stricken gunmen who clawed one another in attempting to escape the deadly inferno. A moment later, he hovers in curious flight high in the starry sky. Now to get this jacket off Lois's head. There. She ought to be all right in a moment now. Then I can drop down on Mr. Haller again. Lois. Hey, that's funny. She's limp as a rag and her hands are ice cold. Great Scott, her pulse is weak. I'd better not take any chances. Better get her to a doctor fast. Must be one in the village. Away! <laughs> Lane's going to be all right, Doctor. Quite sure, Superman. She evidently inhaled some burning gasoline fumes and became partially asphyxiated. Fortunately, you got her here in time. Good. I've given her some oxygen and a sedative. I'd leave her here if I were you, certainly until morning. Oh, well, I'd be glad to, Doctor, if it isn't too much trouble. No trouble at all. In fact, I'm quite proud to be able to do something for a friend of Superman's. Well, thank you. Now, I've got to leave now. Well, you go right ahead, and don't you worry about the young lady. Thanks again, Doc. Oh, yes, one thing. W- would you please tell Miss Lane that Clark Kent is all right? Tell her he uh, escaped without injury. Be glad to. Good night. And thanks for everything. You're more than welcome. Good night. Now, to get back to Richard Haller and his gang. Up and away! <laughs> There's Haller's place in that clearing. Whoop! Great Scott! The barn burned to the ground and the rocket, it's completely destroyed. Everyone's gone. Haller and his thugs, all of them. The place is deserted. No, wait. There's someone in the farmhouse. It's Haller himself. He's all alone. He seems to be waiting for someone. Down! Down! I rather thought you'd be back. Too late for the rocket, though. But not too late for you. You're not interested in me. Now that the original rocket's gone for good, I'm not very important to you or anyone else, am I? You may be very important to the FBI and the War Department. Now, just a minute. You don't think I waited here for you to be taken to the FBI? Hardly. I don't care why you waited. All I Perhaps know is... before you tell me what you know, I'd better tell you what I know. I have evidence and proof that Clark Kent and Superman are one and the same person. 
Now, where did you get that ridiculous information? From very reliable sources. You don't deny it, do you? I wouldn't waste time denying it. And you admit it. I admit nothing. And if you think this little stall is going to save your neck, you're crazy. I'm delivering you to the FBI in Washington if it's the last thing I do. Of course, you know the first thing I'll tell them and the world is that Clark Kent is Superman. They'll laugh at you. Not when I show them the proof. What proof? For one thing, even Kent's Bible. Your foster father's Bible. My foster father? What are you talking about? No use, Superman. I've got it in black and white. There were several entries in the back of Eben Kent's Bible. One had to do with a rocket that fell from the sky. A rocket with an infant boy in it. And there was another entry about how Kent's adopted the child. How they named him Clark and brought him up. About how big and strong he was. Stronger than any other boy in the county. It was simple for me to put two and two together. Only this time, two and two don't make four. You're barking up the wrong tree, Haller. Am I? What about this? Tonight before the fire, I emptied my automatic at Clark Kent. Now, I am a cracked pistol shot, and I couldn't possibly have missed with all eight bullets. And yet, Mr. Kent wasn't hit. Do you know why? Because the bullets bounced off his body. All through? Yes, and I think that's enough. But don't let it worry you, Superman. I'll keep your secret if you keep mine. Do you think, even if your fantastic story were true, that I'd make a deal with you? If you don't, you're washed up. Huh. You'll never be able to work undercover again. Now get this straight, Haller. I don't care what evidence you think you've got. I don't care whether it means the finish of me. I'm taking you to the FBI without any deals and without any bargains. And I'm taking you now. <laughs> I just spoke with Mr. Miller, Superman. He's leaving his home at once. He should be here in 45 minutes. Oh, thank you. We'll wait. Sit down, Haller. <laughs> You're really going through with this, aren't you? You bet I am. All right. I know when I'm licked. I thought I could blackmail you into giving me a break, but I was wrong. What can I do now to square things? You can't square anything with me. I suppose. Just suppose I gave you the secret of the Superman rocket. You can't give it to me because you haven't got it. The original rocket went up in flames and the model you tested exploded. You forgot one small detail. I know that detail, and once I dispose of you, I'm going to build a model myself. You can't. The original's gone. It's melted steel and ashes. You can't make another model. But maybe you won't have to. Maybe I have one already made. That line won't work, Haller. No, it isn't a line. Believe me, it's the truth. There is another model. Really? Yes. And if you take me to my house in Metropolis, if you can get me there in 20 minutes, you can have the model. Huh. Why 20 minutes? I'll tell you why. I gave the model to one of my men. He's going to call my house at 3 a.m. It's 20 minutes to 3 now. If I'm not there, he has orders to destroy the model. Why are you doing this? Why this sudden change of heart? I told you I know I'm licked. Maybe if I cooperate, the FBI won't be so hard on me. I don't trust you, Haller. You're up to something. No, believe me, I'm not. I'm just trying to make things easier for myself. What could I possibly hope to gain by lying to you now? Oh, nothing, really. No, absolutely nothing. I gambled on being able to threaten you into playing ball with me, and I lost. Now I might just as well cooperate. Doesn't that make sense? Yes, I suppose it does. Then take me to Metropolis. There's only 15 minutes left. I... All right, Haller. I'll take a chance. As you said, what can I lose? You lose nothing, but we must hurry. Time is short. Don't worry about the time. I'll get you there before three. Let's go, Haller. <laughs> to go, Haller. Where's your pal's phone call? He'll call. Don't worry. He'd better. For your sake, more than mine. Why won't you trust me? Didn't I give you even Kent's Bible? When a man like you gives something away, especially something as valuable as you think that Bible is, I really get suspicious. I'm smart enough to know when I'm licked. When you wouldn't play ball with me even to save the secret of your double identity, I knew I was through. Hmm. Less than a minute left now. Joe will call. I, I can depend on him. Twenty-five seconds. You call, I tell you. Twenty seconds. Joe never let me down. He won't now. Fifteen seconds. Fourteen. Thirteen. Twelve. Three o'clock. Your man didn't call, Haller. <laughs> Maybe the clock's fast. We checked it with both of our watches, remember? Oh, oh yeah. All right, come on, Haller, open up. You knew there wasn't going to be any phone call. You're up to some trick. What is it? No, no, it's no trick. I, I swear it's Superman. Maybe something happened to Joe. Something's going to happen to you and no maybes unless you tell me the truth. There isn't another model of the rocket, is there? Yes, there is. There is, eh? Well. Must be Joe now. All right, answer it. 
And remember, I'm right here. So don't try anything. Hello, that you, Joe? Everything okay? Oh, good. Bring it right over here. Hurry. Yes, to my house. Hold on. Yeah, there, you see? That was Joe. He's bringing the model right over. I believe it when I see it. And you're a hard man to convince, but Joe will be here in a few minutes, and then you'll see for yourself. <laughs> Wrapped it in this paper, boss. Okay, Joe, here. Right. Here's your model, Superman. Do you believe now I'm shooting straight with you? Well, looks like the right model, but... It is the right model. We made it the same time we made the other one from the same designs and the same dyes. There seems to be a slight difference. I can't quite put my finger on it. Well, there can't be any difference. It's a perfect scale duplicate of the original Superman rocket. Well, I'll find out soon enough. I'm going to take care of that little detail that you found missing in the other one and then test the model. You are? Where? When? That's my business, Heller. I'm going to get to work right now. Oh, by the way, don't either of you try to leave this house. The police squad I called for is on the grounds now. Oh, we won't try to leave. Good. Oh, uh, Superman. Yes? If the model works, and I'm sure it will, the FBI ought to appreciate my cooperation, huh? That's up to them. Good night. Good night. Good night. Gee, boss, I don't know what you're up to, but I don't like it. Monkeying around with Superman. He's too big. The bigger they are, Joe, the harder they fall. And Superman's going to fall like a ton of bricks. Now I'll just set the model in the vise here, Jim, like this. Well, it looks like a little rocket, Mr. Kent. Uh-huh, that's exactly what it is. It's the model of the Superman rocket. The what? The Superman rocket. The one in which Superman came to Earth from the planet Krypton a long time ago. What? You're kidding. No, I'm not. There, that ought to hold. Here you are. How could you have a model of Superman's rocket? Well, it's a long story, but take my word for it. This is it. Now, get me your power drill, will you, Jim? The, the one I gave you for Christmas. Oh, now, wait a minute. Tell me There's what... no the... time, Jim. I've got to find out if I'm right about this and if Howard played square with me. If he didn't, I've got to get back to that red-bearded rascal. What and... red-bearded rascal? Will you get me the drill? Oh, okay. You're always doing this, Mr. Ken. You spring a big surprise, like this being a model of Superman's rocket, and then you won't explain. Later, I said. Uh, what's the finest point you have, Jim, for drilling through steel? Uh, thirty-second of an inch. That do? Uh-huh, I think so. I was using it just the other night. I... Yeah, here it is. Okay, let me have it, will you? And the drill, please. Oh, yes, and, and plug in your electric soldering iron. Okay. Here's the drill. Thanks. Now, will you please tell me what this is all about, Mr. Kent? Where did you Later. get... Later. Better step back a little, Jim. I'm going to bore a hole in the nose of the rocket. Well, what are you doing that for? I'm going to insert a diamond chip in the nose. A diamond chip? Uh-huh. There was a diamond hidden in the nose of the Superman rocket. Haller and his experts missed it when they built the two models. It's my hunch that the diamond acted as a governor. Huh? You see, the diamond is the hardest mineral known and the most heat resistant. I think it governed the speed of the rocket, prevented it from going too fast and burning up by slowing it down when too much heat flowed through it. It swerved the rocket's direction when it was approaching cosmic dust, powerful meteors, and so on. You follow? Well, not exactly, but... There, yeah, that ought to do it. Now, let's see if I squeeze the diamond small enough. What do you mean, squeeze the diamond? Uh, oh, uh, just a figure of speech, Jim. Here we are. I think it'll do. That's the smallest diamond I ever saw. You're going to put it in the rocket's nose, huh? Uh-huh, I hope it does the trick. There, I can push it into place with the drill. That does it. Now, let's have the soldering iron, Jim. I want to seal the opening in the nose. Coming up. Here you are. Thanks. Golly, you think that little diamond chip will do the trick, huh? Keep your fingers crossed. Sheepers. There, it's sealed. Now, we just take the model out of the vise. And... I wonder. What, Mr. Ken? I don't know. I, I can't put my finger on it, Jim, but this model seems different in some way. Different? Well, what do you mean? From the first model and the original Superman rocket. Different? How? I don't know. Seems to be identical, and yet... Well, maybe I'm just imagining it because I don't trust Haller. Sure, that's probably all it is. All right, let's go. Oh, where? To Metropolis Park to find out if I've solved the secret of the Superman rocket. This place ought to do, Jim. Gosh, I'm nervous as a cat, Mr. Kent. Okay, I'm a bit jittery myself. Let's see now. The directional finders are set. The rocket should go up to its peak altitude, then level out and circle back. We hope. We hope. Well... Here goes. Hey, wait. What about the fuel? Oh, the chambers have enough gas and liquid oxygen to get the rocket started. When it's underway, it draws its own fuel out of the air. Oh. All right, Jim, take a deep breath now. Here it goes. Wow. Look at it go, Mr. Ken. Huh? So far, so good. Golly. 
It's practically out of sight already. I can see it. Should reach its peak altitude in a moment. It's above the clouds now. Yes, it's starting to level off. It's performing beautifully, Jim. It is? Uh Uh-huh. Well, I can't see it at all anymore. I can see it clearly. Beginning to circle and come back. We did it, Jim. We did it. We? Oh, you mean you did it? Wait a minute. What the... What's the matter? Well, I don't know. I I can't see it anymore. You can't? Well, you just Jim, the... That rocket's disappeared. Disappeared? Yes, it... It just vanished. It's gone. I must be dreaming it. It it vanished, Jim. Well, relax, Mr. Ken. It's just up so high you can't see it. Oh, I could if it was there. I was following it. I I, I could see it clearly, but now I can't see it anymore. You wait here, Jim. Where are you going? Stay where you are. Why? Where are you going? Mr. Ken? Mr. Ken? Hey, Mr. Ken? Now, into these bushes. Jim won't be able to see me here. Now, out of these clothes, this is a job for Superman. Still can't see that model. I don't understand it. It didn't explode, and it couldn't just evaporate. I've got to find it. There we are, all set. Up and away! Just about up here. Over the ball field when it disappeared. Now, let's see. It started to circle to the west. Away! No, still don't see it. Up! Way up for a bird's eye view. There's the whole park below me. There's Jim. What did happen to that model? It couldn't have fallen. I would have seen it. And yet, what else could have happened to it? There's the lagoon down there. All right, I'll search that and then every inch of the park. Away! Speaking down, Superman hovers in curious flight over the gleaming lagoon, his keen eyes probing its depths for the tiny missing rocket model. Failing to find it there, he flashes away, whooping and wheeling over trees, bushes, lawns, searching every inch of the city park. Finally, confused and puzzled, he admits defeat and veers southward, heading for the nation's capital. A short time later, the Man of Steel is in conference with John Miller of the Federal Bureau of Investigation and Colonel Reed of Military Intelligence. The model was directly over the ball field, Mr. Miller, in the center of the park, when I lost sight of it. But it didn't fall into the park. I searched every inch of it. Somebody might have picked it up, Superman. The sun was just rising when it was launched, Mr. Miller. Except for a few attendants at the zoo and a few police officers, the park was deserted. And neither the zoo attendants nor the police officers picked up the model. I made sure of that. It must have flown beyond the park, then. I tell you, it didn't, Colonel Reed. I had my eyes on it every moment. It it, it had reached its peak altitude and was leveling off and circling back when it, it... Well, it just disappeared. You say it was a couple of miles up? Yes, at least two, maybe three. It may have caught fire the way the first model did and been destroyed. No. But it was only 18 inches long and miles up in the air. You could very well not have seen it burning up. I would have seen it. It did not catch fire, Colonel Reed. Now, look, Superman. It couldn't have just evaporated. No, I I can't understand it, Mr. Miller. You say the original rocket was destroyed, Superman. Completely and totally destroyed. And this model you had was the only one? Yes. Haller says that he designs that dyes everything went up in smoke in the barn burn. He might be lying. I don't think he is in this case. I saw the designs and dyes in the barn last night before the fire. And I don't remember them well enough to make a model myself. Wait a minute. I just remembered something. Yes? What, Superman? When Haller gave me the model, I had a feeling it wasn't quite the same as the first one. The one I saw him test. Oh? How do you mean? Well, I'm not quite sure. It looked identical, and yet... Well, there seemed to be something different about it. Something I... I, I couldn't quite put my finger on. I wonder if Haller didn't do something to that model before he gave it to me. Something to, well, to make it disappear. Oh, nonsense. Well, as I see it, there are only two possibilities. One, the model which absorbs its fuel from the atmosphere is still flying. Two, it escaped your sight, Superman. Maybe the sun got in your eyes and it fell somewhere. Oh, you're wrong, Colonel. I, I agree with Colonel Reed. I'll go to Metropolis at once and organize a search for it. I'll go with you. I want to see this Richard Haller. Well, I repeat, you're both wrong, but I want to see Haller, too, for another reason. So if you don't mind traveling via Superman Express, I'll take you both to his house in a matter of seconds. Fine with me. How about you, Colonel? Excellent. Okay. Up with this window, then. Now. There we are. All set. Ready? Go ahead, Superman. Hang on, then. Up and away! Sergeant Healy, this is Colonel Reed of Military Intelligence. How do you do? How do you do, Sergeant? This is Mr. Miller of the FBI. Pleased to meet you, sir. Hello, Sergeant. I understand you've got Haller waiting for us inside. He's waiting all right, just as Superman left him. That's what you think. Come inside, all of you. Yeah? What's happened? You'll see for yourselves. Hurry! 
Well, how do you like that? He got away. Right, Sergeant. And he took his Hindu servant and a gunman named Joe with him. I thought you and your men were watching this house, Sergeant. We were, sir. Nobody came out of it. I can't understand this. It's simple, Sergeant. Tragically simple. The garage is connected to the house and the garage doors lead out into the alley. We didn't get out through the garage. I've got a man stationed in the alley. Yes, you'll find your man lying there with a bullet in his back. What? What's that? Chances are he was shot from the garage window with a silencer equipped revolver. Holy mackerel, I've got to see about this. Well, Superman, now what? I'm afraid Haller outsmarted me, Colonel. It's my hunch that he has the rocket model which I completed for him. And unless we can work a miracle, the next time we see it, a full-scale version of it may endanger all our lives. Yes. This is the model, all right, Fletcher. No doubt about it. Of course it is, Mr. Haller. Did I not tell you that if it was launched anywhere within 500 miles of here, I would secure it? How did you do it? Uh, you have heard of radio-controlled planes, Nine? Yes. Yeah. You see this directional fin near the propeller and the thin filament of wire on its uh, underside? Yes. That wire receives radio impulses. Radio impulses? Yeah, and transmits them to a tiny control I placed in the propeller shaft itself. Uh Um, The control, of course, was tuned to a special shortwave beam so that broadcasting from my transmitter here, I was able to guide the flight and direction of the rocket. So that's it. The rocket was radio-controlled, and when Superman launched it, you brought it in here. That is correct. And uh, thanks to Superman, we now not only have the model we constructed, but also the one thing we overlooked, the diamond in the head. Nothing can stop us now, Schweitzer, nothing. Now pack up as fast as you can, and let's clear out of here. We'll leave for Europe tonight. Tonight? With the FBI and Superman looking for us? Or would it not be better to wait? Don't worry, all arrangements have been made. A special plane is waiting to take us to our destination. <laughs> By this time tomorrow, Schweitzer, we'll have more money than we ever dreamed of. And a nice, safe place to spend it when Superman rockets start falling on this country. A fine mess you made of things, Kent. A fine mess. Well, don't rub it in, Chief. I feel bad enough. Oh, you feel bad, do you? Yes. Well, how'd you feel if some crazy loon like Hitler gets hold of that model, manufactures full-size rockets, and begins showering us? Well, that's exactly uh, what I'm Mr. afraid. Mr. Might have... Yes, come in. Get out of here, Olson. I just want to ask Mr. Taylor... You can ask him anything you want in five minutes, when you're both out looking for new jobs. Huh? You mean I'm fired again? You bet you are, and without notice. That's the third time this month. I mean it this time. You always say that. Uh, listen, Mr. Kent, did you hear anything from the FBI? No, Jim. The model hasn't been found, and neither has Hallern or any of his gang. Well, if the rocket fell someplace, someone will find it. It didn't fall, Jim. Then maybe it's still flying, and it'll be spotted. No, I said it's directional finders to bring it back after it reached its peak altitude. And it did circle and start back when it disappeared. I... Well, I don't know. I, I think Haller somehow got hold of it. Well, how could he? He and his experts had a chance to tamper with it before they delivered it to me last night. I know it sounds fantastic, but... Well, well, what, mastermind? I think what might have happened is that... Uh, just a minute. Hello? Who? Oh, yes, yes, he's here. Uh, for you, Ken. Oh, thanks. Oh, Ken speaking. This is John Miller, Ken. FBI. Oh, yes, Mr. Miller. Superman said I could contact him through you. Well, uh, uh, yeah, yes, that's right. Well, get in touch with him, then, and tell him to come to 121 West 18th Street. Something's just broken on this case. 121 West 18th? Right, I... Uh, uh, he'll be there in a few minutes, Mr. Miller. I've got to run. See you two later. Now, wait a minute. Where are you going, Ken? No time to explain it now, Chief. So long. Leaving Perry White's office, Clark Kent hurries to a deserted storeroom where he quickly strips off his business suit to reveal the blue costume and brilliant red cape of Superman. Then, raising a window... Up and away! Breaks away like an arrow shot from a giant bow, and seconds later, enters an abandoned warehouse on West 18th Street. Several men, some with cameras and flashlights, move cautiously about the dusty top floor. Under an open skylight stands John Miller of the FBI, and a small elderly man with white hair and faded, kindly blue eyes. Tell Superman what you saw this morning, Mr. Peters. Well, sir, I was up on my roof, and just after daylight was, and taking care of my pigeons. I always feed them and give them a little flight first thing in the morning. Mr. Peters lives right across the street, Superman. I see. I just released my birds, and they were beginning to circle up. And then I heard something, kind of a steady hum. A hum? Yes. Kept getting louder and louder. Sounded like a swarm of bees. But pretty soon I heard it right over my head. But still, I couldn't see a solitary thing. It might have been a plane. Too far up for you to see. No, no, I finally saw it. And it wasn't the plane. Oh? What was it? Well, I wouldn't want to say for sure. I had only a quick glimpse of it before it bumped against a long steel pole sticking up out of this skylight. Then dropped down into the warehouse. It seemed, well, misty-like. I could hardly make it out. But it was like a long metal pencil or maybe like a silvery cigar. Oh? And uh, it had a little propeller on it. A propeller? Are you sure? I wouldn't want to swear to it. As I say, it was like trying to see something in a thick mist. 
Even though there, there wasn't any mist this morning. But uh, I'm pretty sure. Mr. Miller, if this man is right, he may have seen the missing rocket monitor. Well, it he... could have been drawn here by radio control. The steel pole Mr. Peters saw sticking up through the skylight might have been connected with a shortwave receiver. Well, I suppose it's possible, And but the I... difficulty he had in seeing the rocket from only a few feet away, the sort of mist around it, must have been due to some sort of camouflage on the model. A camouflage so good even I couldn't see through it. Oh, Mr. Miller. Now, what is it, Johnson? Uh, Adams just called in from the lab. Uh, one set of fingerprints we found here are Richard Haller. They are. I knew it. Uh, Haller received a permit to carry a gun several years ago, and the prints checked. Then Haller has the model. You were right, Superman. Now we've got to stop him before he can get out of the country with it. Come on. We've got work to do. Emergency order to all state, city, township, and village enforcement officers. Wanted. Richard Heller, six feet two, weight 195 pounds. Red hair and red beard. Age 46. Well educated. Probably armed. Very dangerous. May be accompanied by German national named Arnold Schweitzer. Or American named George Barton. Suspected of attempting to leave country with small rocket model. This man must be found. Driving on the main highway? That's not safe, Mr. Haller. Why do we not drive on side roads? This is the fastest way, Schweitzer. The plane is waiting for us. We're taking off tonight in two hours. But you heard of the radio, Superman, the FBI, the police all over the country. Look for us. Don't worry. They won't find us. We... Oh, oh, what's that? What? Looks like a roadblock up ahead. A uh, 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 roadblock? <laughs> Quickly, Mr. Haller, t- t- turn back. Relax, Schweitzer. Leave everything to me. What's the trouble, officer? Just sit where you are. I want to have a look at you. At us? Why? Got my reasons. Your uh, flashlight hurts my eye. Ah, don't see no red beard and red hair neither on you, are you, partner? Of course not. What do you mean? We're well, looking for a fellow with red hair and a red beard. Okay, you can get going. Thanks, and I hope you find your man. Good night, officer. <laughs> You can relax, Schweitzer. <laughs> never, never was I so scared, Mr. Haller. Amazing what a little hair dye and a razor can do. Eh? How much uh, farther is it to the plane? We'll be there in about an hour. And then not even Superman can stop us. <laughs> we'll be sitting on top of the world. Chuckling, Richard Haller drives on swiftly, closing the gap of short miles between him and the getaway plane. Meanwhile, at FBI headquarters with John Miller, Superman watches reports of the nationwide search for Richard Haller come in over the teletype. Uh, no soap in Jersey. Nothing from Pennsylvania, blank in Delaware and Maryland. The only luck we're having so far, Superman, is bad luck. I don't think we'll ever find Haller this way, Mr. Miller. We've got to find him. He's clever, He's but... too clever to be caught in the ordinary way. There's only one way he can be stopped before he delivers that rocket model to a foreign government. What do you mean? It's up to me. There's a chance... Just one, and a slim one at that. But maybe I can do it. I'm certain Haller skipped the country, Mr. Miller. And there's only one person alive who might still prevent him from carrying out his plan. Who? Superman. You? Yes. But before I tell you what I propose to do, I need your help. What do you mean? Your men intercepted a letter some time ago offering the Superman rocket for sale. It was written to a foreign agent. That's right. Who was that agent? And what country does he represent? His name is Ramos. Ramos? Yes. But we don't know what country he represents. We don't even know his nationality. You don't? No, he's a mysterious devil and a cunning one. During the war, he worked for the Nazis. Uh-huh. And he remained in Europe after the war. Now, chances are he's working for one of the few countries there which don't belong to the United Nations. You said there. You mean in Europe? Yes. Of course, I'm not positive. Sounds like a good hunch to me, and I'm going to play it. Now, goodbye, Mr. Miller. You'll be hearing from me. Oh, just a minute. Where are you going? I'm heading for Europe. Oh, wait, man. You can't go barging into other countries making searches and accusations. That's practically an act of war. Well, I don't intend to go barging into other countries. I'm going to do my hunting in no man's land. No man's land? The free air over the Atlantic Ocean, a hundred miles or so off the European coastline. I'm going to patrol that coastline, and if Haller tries to come through by sea or by air, I'll get him. But, but good heavens, man, even you can't cover a territory that large. Why, it's thousands of miles. I can move pretty fast. Faster even than the Superman rocket. I know. But... And as I see it, this is our only chance to stop Haller. If I don't stop him... My own rocket, multiplied by hundreds, will destroy us and all other democratic nations. I heard Haller say that myself. I don't think even you can do it, but, well, come with me. Where? There's no time to lose. I've got to get started. I can help you, and it won't take a minute. Come this way. Now, this little portable radio outfit is more powerful than it looks, Superman. Oh? It can receive and transmit shortwave messages over a radius of a thousand miles. Here, I'll help you strap it on your chest. Right, thanks, Mr. Miller. Chief of Staff is instructing all naval and air units at sea to report any unidentified plane or ship to the battleship Dakota. 
The Dakota is taking up a position about midway in the Atlantic and will pass on any information to you. Good. More eyes, the better on this job. There we are. I'm all set. Now, just open this window. Well, goodbye, Mr. Miller. Goodbye, Superman. And good luck. Thanks. I'm going to need it. Up and away! <laughs> Leaping high above FBI headquarters, Superman takes a bearing from the stars, then streaks away to the east like a rushing comet, flashing through the heavens of night. High above the heaving black Atlantic, he hovers for a moment to peer in at a majestic clipper plane winging eastward. Then onward he streaks, only to check suddenly in a great rush of air and plummet downward like some giant bird of prey, toward where a long, sweet yacht slides through the dark waves. Wheeling above it in curious flight, the man of steel satisfies himself that his quarry is not aboard. And then, on again he bolts into the east, toward where the sky is lightening. And the long, dim coastlines of Europe and Africa wind far below. The storm is building, thunder and flashing rain and pounding wind. But like a red and blue bolt, Superman flashes northward through the heightening storm, his keen eyes searching the lightning shot air and salty sea below. High to the uppermost tip of Norway, and then back along the coast of Europe and a thousand miles of Africa. Moving far faster than the speed of sound, the man of steel veers and bolts northward again, dashing the rain from his eyes, unafraid of the lightning which crackles about him like mighty whips of fire, keeping tirelessly to his incredible patrol. Away! Faster! For hours he cruises as the fury of the storm increases, and then, suddenly, he hears a voice. Superman? Dakota's calling Superman? Come in, please. Superman to Dakota. Go ahead. Our radar picked up an unknown plane. At least we think it's a plane about two hours ago. It was flying east, heading toward your first position at about 35,000 feet. We held it on the screen for 400 miles. It was holding the same position, due east, 3961. That would put it a bit south of dead mid-continent. Over. I'll look into it and let you know. Wait. I think I hear a plane now. Over and out. Yes, that does sound like a plane. Above me and coming this way. Up! Up! It's a plane, all right. I'm sure of it. I can't see it yet, though. Wouldn't answer our ships and planes, eh? Well, maybe this is Mr. Haller coming right into my hands. Let's find out. Away! This storm is getting worse. I can hear that plane clearly now, but I can't see it. it seems to be ahead and... And to the right. Away! The storm force first, Mr. Haller. Yes, Spicer, it does seem to be getting worse. Here comes Ramos. Maybe he can tell us something. I have just spoken to the pilot gentleman. He says while the storm is bad, it is not too bad. He promises to deliver us safely at the airport within the hour. Well, if he's not worried, I guess it's okay. Yeah, but uh, Mr. Haller, look! Watch right, sir. There, outside the window. Look. Santa Maria. A man. It's Superman. Superman. Hold me a lot. Take it easy, Schweitzer. He can't see us through your camouflage on the plane. But, but look, he comes close up. He can't see us, I tell you. He couldn't see the rocket model when it was camouflaged, could he? Oh, we are lost. What do we do? All right. He can't see us, I tell you. But he hears our motors. He knows there is a plane. Oh, we are lost. Quiet. Come on. Tell your pilot to cut the motors. Hurry. In this storm. Oh, he's too dangerous. Not as dangerous as Superman. It'll only be for a minute or two until we lose him. Hurry now. Start saying your prayers, Haller. I'll have my hands on you and I'm up. What the? I can't hear the plane. What happened to it? Great. Got it. It's gone. <laughs> we did it. We lost Superman. Look back, Schweitzer. You can't see him anymore. Yeah. Yeah, that is good, Mr. Haller. I thought our last moment had arrived. <laughs> he thought so, too. But I fooled him. I've got his rocket. I'll get millions for it. And when he sees it again, it'll be landing on his beloved country, blowing it to bits. What happened? Mr. Dollar, the pilot says he must turn on the engines now. Not yet, Ramos. I want to get farther away from Superman. But without the engines in this storm, we are in great danger. We'll be in worse danger if Superman caps us. Tell your pilot to ride it out a few minutes longer. I will tell him, but I do not like it. Tell him that the plane is being tossed about like a feather. We'll be all right. Follow the lightning, Spikeman. It didn't, and it won't. My luck carried me this far, 
Oh, let me down now. Oh, we are falling. Mr. Hollow, do something. We are falling, Mr. Hollow. Stop, you coward. The wind's just knocking us around a bit. We are falling, I tell you. We will be killed. Will you shut up, you chicken-hearted fool? Mr. Collard, the pilot says he can no longer control the plane without the engines. Unless he turns them on at once, we will surely crash. Him and Mr. Hollow, please tell it to... Okay, Ramos. Tell him to turn them on. See. Start the engines, my boy. Uh, I guess we gave Superman the slip by this time. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, how long will it be before we reach our destination? Not long. Another hour or so, and we can laugh at Superman and the whole world. Greetings, gentlemen. No, no, better, Mr. Haller. Look. Superman. Thanks for turning the motors on, Haller. You had me worried for a few minutes. Well, aren't you going to bring out the refreshments? When three old friends like us get together, it calls for a celebration. Don't come any closer. Are you kidding, Haller? You know that revolver can't hurt me. It's a rocket model. It is in this little box. I see it. Shut up, Fletcher. We will give it to you if you will let us go. You'll give it to me, all right, but I'm not letting you go. We're all taking a trip back to Washington. So if you're ready... Here you are. Now listen, I took photographs of your foster father's Bible. Those photographs will prove to the world that you're Clark Kent. Now I'll make a deal with you. I'll give you the photographs... Save your breath, Haller. I told you once before that I don't make deals with traitors and murderers. But your double identity, your great secret will be revealed. I left the photographs in Metropolis with instructions that if anything happened to me... They were to be released to all newspapers. Even if you were telling the truth, I'd still take you back to Washington. But you're lying. The photographs are in your suitcase. I can see them. We've wasted enough time now, so... Don't come any closer. I'll throw the model through the window into the sea. I won't have it then, but neither will you. I wouldn't try anything like that, Haller, if I were you. I'll do it, I tell you. Unless you promise to let me go... Never. Take the model and let us go, Superman. No, I... One step more and the model goes to the bottom of the sea. If you throw it, Haller, I'm going after it. But first, I'll tear the engines off your plane so you can't get away. You might drown before I get back to you. You'll never find the model in this storm. Now listen to me, Superman. I'm all through listening. Give me the model. Give it to him, Haller! No! Here it goes into the sea! But... You fool! I've got to get that rocket, but I can't let you go, so now heaven help you! Oh, and away! He did clear the motor up! Anna, you have been trying that! Speaking for the FBI, Superman, I want to thank you for all you did. This tiny rocket, which would have destroyed us, will now help us preserve peace throughout the world. Oh, thanks, Mr. Miller. And speaking for G2, I want to apologize to you, Superman, for ever dreaming that you could have been involved in anything dishonorable. Oh, forget it, Colonel Reed. Well, I've got to leave oh, now. One moment, Superman. There's no doubt about Haller, Schweitzer, and Ramos being dead, is there? None at all. By the time I'd located the model, their plane had crashed into the sea. I managed to rescue the pilot and the co-pilot, but the other three were done for. I hate to say it, but they had it coming to them. Is there anything else, gentlemen? No. Except thanks again. A million thanks. Don't thank me. I'm happy I could be of service. Oh, by the way, Mr. Miller, I'd like to ask a favor. Uh, certainly. What is it? Well, Clark Kent of the Daily Planet was uh, quite valuable to me in this matter. More valuable than you'll ever know. And so was Miss Lane of the same paper. If you have no objection, I'd like to give them a scoop on this story. Well, I think they deserve it. How about it, Colonel? If Superman wants it that way, it's fine with me. I appreciate it. And so will Kent and Miss Lane. Well, goodbye, gentlemen. Goodbye. Goodbye. Returning to the Metropolis Daily Planet in his guise of Clark Kent, the mild-mannered, bespectacled reporter, Superman swiftly typed the story of the secret rocket and placed it on Editor Perry White's desk. As we join him now, he is in his own office as the gray-haired editor enters. Uh, congratulations, Ken, congratulations. Why, this is the finest piece of work you've ever done. Why, it's the finest piece of work any reporter has ever done. Well... Ah, <laughs> yes, and it's all ours. The scoop of the year. <laughs> Here, give me your hand, Ken. Give me your hand. I was pretty, pretty rough on you the other day. I want to apologize. Oh, forget it, Chief. Uh, listen, what about Lois? Hmm? Well, what about Lois? Well, I mean, I, I suppose she's entirely recovered by now, isn't she? Recovered? Uh-huh. Recovered from what? Well, from her injury, of course. What injury? What are you talking about? Now, wait a minute. You mean she didn't tell you about being hurt at Haller's place? Well, how could she? I haven't seen her since she left with you. Well, you haven't seen her. Well, that's what I said. Now, what's this about her being hurt? Where is she? Hey, now, just a minute, Chief. Let me get this straight. You didn't see Lois yesterday? Or today, either? Can't you hear well, Kent? How could I see Lois? She was away with you, wasn't she? Well, not since the night before last when she was hurt. 
jump and catfish, then... Then... then, 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 then wait, 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 wait a minute. Wait a minute. Here's what happened, as far as I know. Superman left Lois at a doctor's house in the country. Now, that was the night before last. Uh-huh. I stopped off there today on my way back from Washington, and the doctor said Lois left his house yesterday morning saying she was going back to Metropolis. Yesterday morning? That's right. And Cross Junction, where she was, isn't more than four or five hours from here, so she... Oh, wait a minute. Well, who are you calling? Calling Lois's apartment. Well, don't bother. She isn't there. Oh? How do you know? Well, I called there all day yesterday and every half hour this morning until you showed up. Uh, unless oh, she... Wait a minute, Chief. They're, they're, they're ringing now. Well, Lois isn't there, I tell you. I even talked to her superintendent this morning. I had him go up to her apartment no, and... You're right. There's, there's no answer. I told you she's not there. Something's wrong, Chief. Something's very wrong. What time did Miss Lane leave your house yesterday morning, Dr. Morrison? Well, uh, let's see, Mr. Kent. She had breakfast with my wife and me at about 7.30. She left right afterwards. Well, that would be about 8 o'clock, I'd say. Uh-huh. And she said she was going straight back to Metropolis? That's right. She asked about trains, and I told her the local went through here at 8.20, made connections with the Limited at Willow Falls, so she could be in Metropolis a little past noon. Now, tell me, uh, how did she go to the station, do you know? Yes, she walked. Oh, I do hope nothing's happened to her, Mr. Kent. I'm afraid something did. Well, thanks very much, Dr. Morrison. I, uh, I'm i going over to the railroad station to see what I can find out there. Do you remember selling a ticket yesterday morning to a dark, attractive young lady wearing a gray suit? No, sir. I didn't sell nobody like that a ticket yesterday morning or yesterday afternoon any other time, mister. Are you sure? I'm positive. Only folks took a train out across Junction yesterday was Richie Evans, Mrs. Spreckles. Uh, Richie, he took the 8.20 a.m. He is going to Metropolis on business. Mrs. Spreckles, she went out on the 3.09. She's going to Evansville to visit with her daughter for a few days. Can't understand that. Maybe she arrived too late to buy a ticket in the station. She might just have had time to catch the train. I'd have seen her anyhow, mister. Nope. I'm telling you, she won't here. Oh. Well, thanks. Thanks very much. You guys better check with the sheriff. <laughs> agent seems positive Miss Lane didn't leave here by train yesterday, Sheriff, yeah, but Hey, I... Peter says she didn't take a train. She didn't, Mr. Kent. It's got a memory like an elephant. Oh. And you say she didn't leave by bus. Well, the bus driver says so. His chart shows he picked up two passengers in Cross Junction yesterday. He remembers they were Sam and Sally Pruitt. That was the 11.30 bus southbound. 7.18 didn't pick up any passengers here. Oh, this doesn't make sense. Look, what about a hired car or a taxi? There well, ain't no place here she could hire a car, but... Herb Nichols over to the garage. He sometimes takes folks in his car when he's got time. They ain't got any other way to go. Suppose we walk over and ask him. Good idea, Sheriff. Let's go. Uh, sure you didn't drive a young lady any place yesterday, Herb? Yep. Didn't leave the garage all day, Sheriff. Me and Pete was working on Harry Shaler's truck. Well, mm-hmm. uh, do you remember seeing a strange young woman in the village yesterday, Mr. Nichols? She's uh, dark, quite attractive, and she was wearing a gray suit. No, nope. didn't see any strangers in town all week. Uh-huh. Uh, uh, hey, Pete! Yeah? Did uh, you see young lady, stranger, around yesterday? No. Nope. I can't understand this, Sheriff. Apparently, Miss Lane didn't take a train or a bus or a taxi. That means if she left Cross Junction at all, she must have... Well, she must have gone in a strange car, and something must have happened to her. Yeah, look, Mr. Kent. Could be maybe Miss Lane picked up a ride in some car going through the village. Oh, it doesn't seem likely, Sheriff. Now, you think maybe the gal was forced into the car? If she was, she'd have put up a battle, Mr. Nichols. Take my word for that. And certainly somebody would have hurt her. Yes, that seems likely. There's houses all along Elm Street. If she didn't leave in a car, in a train or bus, what do you suppose did happen to her? I wish I knew, Sheriff. I'm worried. Badly worried. I'd better get along. Here, come on. I'll drive you up to the railroad. Depot. No, no, thanks, Sheriff. I, uh, I can manage better alone. Leaving the sheriff at the garage, Clark Kent secretly resumes his true identity of Superman and takes to the skyways to continue his search of the countryside in a desperate hunt for Lois Lane. <laughs> Meanwhile, at an auto tourist camp on the outskirts of Metropolis, an oddly significant scene is taking place. A small boy stands on a patch of lawn set back from the highway, around which are set several identical, freshly painted little cabins. In his hands, the boy holds a slender, curiously carved wooden object, equipped with a gleaming propeller and a thin steel rod about a foot long. Slipping the rod through a slot running the length of the wooden object, he points it at the sky and thrusts sharply. Then its propeller whirling swiftly, the sleek little projectile streaks high into the air, rising high over the treetops, and then, reaching its peak, floats gently back to earth. As the boy rushes forward to retrieve it, a door of one of the cabins opens, and a man calls to him. Tommy! Uh, Tommy! 
Slipper's almost ready. Get the suitcases from the trailer and bring them in, will you? Okay, Dad, in a minute. Hey, watch this. Huh? Hey, what have you got there, son? A little model rocket. A model rocket? Uh-huh. A kid in one of the other cabins helped me make a launching rod for it. Watch it go now, Dad. Look. Here it goes. Oh, yeah. boy. Look at it. Climb, Dad. <laughs> Say, that's pretty good. Yeah, it went higher than that tall pine tree. Hey, where'd you get that thing, Tommy? I found it in our trailer. In our trailer? Uh-huh. It was caught in one of the folds on the canvas on the luggage rack. Here it comes down. I got it. Here, let me see that, son. Oh, sure, Dad. Here. See, it's modeled after the German V2, I think. Yes, could be. Hmm. Pretty neat. You say you found this in our trailer? Yeah. Let me show you how it works, Dad. Watch me make it go up even higher this time. Okay. And I can't understand how it got on our trailer. Wait a minute, Tommy. What's this? What? Oh, that's the propeller. I know, I know that, but... L-O-I... Lewis Lane. Holy smokes. Who's that? Why, that's the name of the girl reporter I was reading about just before... The one who dis- disappeared. Oh, no kidding, Dad. Yes, quick, Tommy. Tell Mother we've got to go into town. I'll get the car started. You and I are taking this model rocket to the police. Oh, there you are, Kent. Oh, Inspector. I was just trying to phone you. Is that so? Anything about Miss Lane? Yeah. Oh, uh, shake hands with Mr. Harris and his son, Tommy. Mr. Harris? Oh, Mr. Kent. Doing? Oh, Tommy. Uh, what about Miss Lane, Inspector? Take a look at this. Hmm. Another rocket model. But what's that guy? Go- Wait a minute. There's something written on the propeller. Right. It's hard to see, but you can make it out, can't you? Wait, let's see. In great danger, call police Lois Lane. Great Scott, where did you get this, Inspector? Mr. Harris just brought it in. My boy, Tommy, found it caught in a fold of the canvas tarpaulin on our trailer, Mr. Kent. What? Yeah, but I don't know how it got there. Where's your trailer, Mr. Harris? At a tourist camp out at the city limits. A place called Cabin Rest on Highway 21. You see, we're driving to Florida, and we... Thanks, stop. thanks very much. Hey, Kent! Wait! Hey, where are you going, Kent? What do you suppose? Out to that trailer camp. Well, wait for me. I want to go out there, too. Can't wait. I'll see you there. So long! No sign of Lois in those cabins. Or anywhere else around there. Down behind those trees. Down! Now, back into Clark Kent's clothes. I want to talk to the proprietor of this tourist camp. You're certain the Harrises are the only guests you've had today, Mr. Johnson? Of course I am, Mr. Kent. You can see here in my register. Uh huh. Fact is, the Harris family the only customers I've had all week. Oh? Well, it's pretty late in the year for folks to be traveling. I'm thinking of closing down till next spring. Look, Mr. Johnson, Tommy Harris found something in his trailer after they'd been here a little while this afternoon. Something put there, or perhaps thrown there, by a young lady who has disappeared. Well, so what? Nothing, except I thought that object might have been dropped into the Harris trailer while it was parked here. Don't see how that could be. Because, like I said before, except for the Harrises and me, there hasn't been a soul in these grounds all day. Well, if that's so, that... Uh-oh. Here comes Inspector Henderson of the Metropolis Police. Police? Huh? Well, now, look here, Mr. Kent. I don't want to become involved. Oh, relax, Mr. Johnson. You've nothing to worry about. Hi, Kent. Find anything? Oh, not a thing, Inspector. Inspector, this is Mr. Johnson. He runs this tourist camp. Oh, hello, Mr. Johnson. Hey, Inspector. Mr. Johnson tells me he hasn't seen anyone other than the Harris family all week. And that's the whole truth. Which means Miss Lane didn't drop the little rocket into Harris's trailer here. Either did it some other place the Harris's stopped, or... But they tell me this is the first stop they made since they left their house this morning. I see. And that would indicate Miss Lane must have thrown the rocket from a passing car and it landed in Harris's trailer. No, huh? no, I, I can't see her a prisoner in a car being able to write a message on the propeller of a model rocket and heave it out of the window. Well, my hunch still says she's being held someplace from which she could fire this little rocket. Yeah? Where? That's what we've got to find out. Uh, Tommy? Yes, Mr. Kent? Tommy, you told me you and another boy made a launching rod for this rocket model. Is that right? Uh-huh. You want to see it? Please, Tommy. Oh, I'll go get it. It's under that tree across the lawn. Okay, come along, Inspector. Well, what's the idea? I want to try a little experiment with the model to see how far it can go. Oh, now, wait a minute, Kent. That won't Here's prove a thing. Rod, Mr. Kent. Thanks, Tommy. Now, we'll just slip the rocket down the rod like this. Now what? Now I'm going to launch it. Here it goes. Shh. Gee, look at it go way up over the trees. Hey, that's pretty good. Yes, went up about, oh, about a hundred feet. Shot straight out or downwards. Now, let's see. With a wind behind it, it might conceivably go four or five times that far. All right, that means, if I'm right about this, Lois is somewhere within four or five hundred feet of some road Tommy and his family drove on today. Gee whiz. Tommy, uh... How did you drive here today? I mean, on what roads? Why, I'm not sure, Mr. Kent. 
I know we came out on Highway 21, 21? but before that, Dad took a lot of side roads. He did, huh? W- would your mother know? I don't think so. She slept a good part of the trip. All right, then I've got to talk with your father and fast. Come on, Inspector. Right. Let's go out to meet him in your car. I've got a feeling there's no time to waste. <laughs> Meanwhile, another scene is taking place in a sagging, abandoned shack that stands in a patch of woods off a dirt road not far from the late Richard Heller's estate. There in the semi-darkness, broken only by the light of a flickering candle, a worried-looking man paces the uneven floor, his face unshaven, his eyes sunken and bloodshot. This is George Barton, once a rocket expert for the United States Army, now a renegade and fugitive from the FBI, as a result of having joined the red-bearded Haller in a plot to reconstruct and sell the Superman rocket to a foreign power. Suddenly, a door opens, and Barton spins about, his face contorted with fear as he holds a revolver in an unsteady hand. Easy on that trigger, Barton. It's me. Oh. Oh, hello, Hanson. I'm jittery, I guess. Well, relax, pal. Well, that's relax. easy to say. But being here alone, except for that... That lame girl tied up in the next room, it's... It's too much for me. Yeah, I know. But I got good news, Barton. You and me, we ain't gonna have to worry about that dame no more. Why? What do you mean? Sit down, and I'll tell you. Yeah, troubles are over, Barton. Everything's fine now. What do you mean by that? Listen, I got big news. I've been down to the village. You showed yourself in the village? You fool with every police officer in the state looking for us? Relax, pal. Nobody's seen me. Besides, I don't think the cops are looking for us anymore. Are you crazy? They want the lost rocket and Haller and everyone connected with them. They uh, don't want Haller anymore either. What? They can look at the headline of this newspaper. Richard Haller crashes to death at sea. Superman recovers lost rocket. Good news, eh? I, I can't believe it. Well, it's true. And now that double-crossing rat Haller is finished and Superman has the rocket, here the cops won't care about us, see? We're in the clear. Don't kid yourself, Hanson. We worked with Haller, so they still want us. And besides, we face another rap just as bad now, Hanson. What do you mean? Right now we are facing a kidnapping rap, too. Remember? And that's punishable by death in this state. What are you talking... Oh. You mean Miss Lane. Exactly. She's locked in the other room. If we're caught with her, it means curtains. We, uh, we don't have to get caught with her, you know. What? Nobody even has to know we ever saw her. Really? How do you propose to accomplish that? You know, Barton. You got a gun. No. No, I, I can't. Why, that's murder. I've never done anything like that. Okay. I'll do it. Where's that, uh, bundle of stuff we brought with you from Hallis? All them uh, drawing tools and the little rockets. Well, they're in the other room where Miss Lane is. Okay, come on. I'll take care of her, and you take your stuff and bury it in the woods. Right? All right. Let's get it over with. She locked the door, Barton. No, there's no lock on the door. She must be blocking it. Oh, yeah? I'll fix that. It's funny, I, I can't budge it. Well, what's the matter with you, Hanson? Let me at it. Yeah, wait a minute. She probably braced a chair under the doorknob. Open the door, Miss Lane. Open it or I'll bust it down. Come on, open it, I said. You better do as we say, Miss Lane. We mean business. Why doesn't she say something? I don't know. Look, do you, do you suppose she got away? Impossible. There's no window in that room. And I was here all the time you were gone. Well, something's fishy. Well, maybe she's just playing possum. Let's try her again. Look here, Miss Lane. If you make us break this door down, it's going to go hard on you. You're wasting your time. If you've got any sense at all, you'll let me alone and try to get away. The police are looking for me. And when they find me, it's all over for you. Yeah, she's right, Hanson. She's right. Maybe we'd better... Come on. Give me a hand and we'll bust it down. We've got to get rid of her. Okay. I've covered most of the distance that auto trailer travel and still no sign of Lois. If I don't find her in the next few minutes, it means I was wrong about this or else that I'm too late. I guess I... Wait a minute. Seems to be something in those woods ahead. I'd better take a look. Away! Now, once more, Hanson, the door's almost off the hinges. Yeah. This'll do it. There. 
Yeah. That does it, Hanson. Now, Miss Lane. Don't, don't. Stay away from me. Stay away. Let her have it, Hanson. Yeah, right now. Hanson. Goodbye, Miss. I'll take that gun. Oh, Superman. All right, Miss Lane. Now, gentlemen. Look out. Superman. Shoot, Hanson. Shoot. You yeah. two are all through shooting. Shoot him, Hanson. Get him off me. Let him go. Oh, you don't believe me, eh? Well, maybe this will convince you. Oh. Uh, number one. Now, you, Mr. Bart. No, no. No. There we are, Miss Lane. Now, oh, let's get Superman. these two. Oh. Oh. Wait a minute. Steady. I've got you. There. I'm sorry. The strain and excitement. Of course. I understand. But uh, I'm all right now. Good girl. Now, you just sit down here while I rope up our two little playmates, then you and I will deliver them to the police. <laughs> Crossing up the unconscious Barton and Hanson, Superman carries them and Lois Lane to Metropolis Police Headquarters. Then, after adding his statement to Lois's and seeing Barton and Hanson locked in cells, the Man of Steel disappears. A short time later, once more in his guise of Clark Kent, mild-mannered and bespectacled reporter, he sits in Editor Perry White's office at the Daily Planet and listens wide-eyed to Lois's recital of her recent adventure. And I don't mind telling you this time, I really thought it was all up with little Lois. But then Superman showed up, and... Oh, I still get weak when I think what almost happened. Well, no wonder, you poor kid. Yeah, but look, Lois, you said there was no window in that room. How did you get the rocket out? Oh, I, I thought I told you, Chief. Oh. There was a hole in the wall near the ceiling. I imagine a stovepipe used to go through it. Uh-huh. And I just stood on a chair and launched the little rocket right through the hole. Must have tried for hours before I managed to send three rockets flying through. You see, I tried to time them for when I heard a car coming on the road nearby. Well, you certainly were lucky to have one land in that trailer. No, you're not kidding, Clark. But where'd you get all the rockets and the, uh, the, uh, launching rod or whatever it is you needed? Oh, they were Barton's. He's a rocket expert, you know, and he had about two dozen models and a lot of drawings and a big suitcase in the room. Uh-huh, but, uh, but how come the... Just a minute, is... Chief. Uh... As I get it, Lois, you were up in the woods when Barton and Hanson caught you and decided to hold you for a hostage in case the police caught up with them, right? Yes, that's right. Well, how did you get up there? I mean, Superman left you at Dr. Morrison's house in Cross Junction, and then, well, you just seemed to disappear into thin air. Well, I, um... I picked up a lift in a, in a car going north. North? Mm-hmm. But Metropolis is south of Cross Junction. That's right. But after I left Dr. Morrison's house, I changed my mind about returning to Metropolis. Oh? Yes, I knew that I had my hands on a terrific story. But uh, I had to go back up to Richard Haller's place in the woods to verify it. Well, what story? Well, uh, if you're referring to the lost rocket yarn, Lois, can't wrap that one up himself. After Haller crashed to his death at sea and Superman recovered the model and plans. Well, Come I... to think of it, I, I really ought to split my byline with you, Lois. You did help some. Oh, thank you very much, Clark. But don't bother. You see, uh, I got a story that I went after, and it makes yours read like a uh, weather report. What? Mm -hmm. What do you mean? What story are you talking about, Lois? This, yeah. Chief, is the biggest scoop this paper ever published, what? or any paper for that matter. There's never been anything like well, it. Well, come on, come on, come on. Come on. And you, too, Clark. You just get set for the shock of your young life. Oh, look here, Lois. Just what is this world-shaking scoop you're talking about? Hmm, just wait until you hear it. Well, well, come on, come on. What is it? What is it? Let's have it. Sure. Not so fast. Chief, don't rush me. Oh. After all, it is a bit of a shock to find out that one of your best friends, one whom you've known and worked with side by side for years, has been leading a double life. Oh, uh, what's that? Who's been leading a double life? Oh, Clark knows. I do? Uh, what, are you, what are you talking about, Lois? It's no use, Clark. I know everything. But, no, 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 listen. You know I, everything I... about what? Will you please make sense? What in thunder is this all about? It's very simple, Chief. It's so simple that we never even guessed it, even though it's been under our noses all this time. What's been under our noses? For the love of heaven, will you stop beating around the bush and get to the point? All right, I will. But just get ready for a shot. No, wait. Wait, Lois, don't... You see, uh, uh... Chief, Clark Kent is Superman. Triumphantly, Lois Lane points her finger at Clark Kent whose face slowly drains of color while Perry White's mouth gapes open. As we know, Lois is right. Kent is Superman. But how did Lois find out, and can she prove it? Richard Haller, who came closer than anyone else in the world to revealing Superman's double identity, is dead. But now Lois says she knows the secret. Will Superman's great secret really be revealed now? Don't miss tomorrow's tense episode when we begin another of Superman's exciting adventures. Be sure to tune in. 
same time, same station, for a new and thrilling story on The Adventures of Superman. And remember, for breakfast, it's Kellogg's Pep. For excitement, The Adventures of Superman. Superman is a copyrighted feature appearing in Superman DC Comics magazine and is brought to you Monday through Friday at this same time by Kellogg's Pep, the super cereal. This program came from New York. Now listen for Captain Midnight, which follows in a moment. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.